Aloha, everybody. Welcome to the Hawaiiverse podcast, a podcast that supports local by telling tourists that the Alawai Canal is the best picnic spot in town. I'm your host, Kamaka Diaz, and a nice sunset picnic right on the beautiful, pristine Alawai Canal sounds so romantic. Nothing beats it. Go look it up yourself if you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, we have an amazing episode today with a very knowledgeable guest. But before we introduce him, I just want to mahalo all my Patreon supporters listening right now and remind the rest of you all to check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash if you love supporting the podcast. I have different tiers with different benefits and would appreciate any support. Okay, let's introduce our guest. Our guest today is a kahu from the island of Oahu. This father of one is a direct descendant of chiefly lineages. This Kanaka Oivi is the founder of Awakened Aloha, which is an organization that focuses on inspiring a world where aloha is the heartbeat of humanity. His work bridges ancient wisdom and ancestral connection to modern wellness through Maoli Ola, healing arts, Lao Lapa'au, natural plant-based medicine, aloha education, and community development. As a passionate coach for healthy masculine development and an avid participant in men's work, he founded the Chiefhood in 2021 to create spaces for men of worldwide heritages to grow in their power, love, and connection led to ourselves, our families, our communities, and the world into a heart-centered humanity. This space creates a container for men who battle with mental, emotional, and relational issues in their lives, plaguing the hearts of men with depression, anxiety, insecurities, and loss of identity or purpose. I can go on and on and on, but let's just talk to him already. He's one of my favorite Instagram profiles to follow, as as well as a former teen bodybuilding champion. His name is Elijah Kala McShane. Aloha, Elijah. Welcome Aloha. to the Hawaii Verse Podcast Aloha. here at Ida Studios. Aloha, Hawaii. Mahalo yeah. for having me. Yeah. How are you doing? Oh, so good. So blessed. <laughs> oh, my God. Cool. It's good to be in the Hawaii Verse Studio. Watched all the episodes uh, <laughs> since they started. So it's I, good to be here finally. We appreciate you. We've been trying to schedule this for a while since last year, actually. Yep. And then, you know, just Keakua didn't want it to happen at that time. And now we're here finally. Bye. Bye. Hey, bro. It's beautiful to be here. Bye. Mahalo, yes. Bro. And I see you've brought something with you as well. What oh, is that? Oh, I brought some beautiful <laughs> Ava. This particular one um, is Fiji Waka. Um, comes from the beautiful islands of Fiji. Um, and it is mixed in Kawai New, also known as coconut uh, water. But this is like the milky kind of water. Can you uh, hold it up so, of so we can see? So this is Kawai uh, Kane, which means the living waters of Kane and Kanaloa, who were two important akua and kupuna um, in our mo'olelo and in our um, history as kanako um, oivio hawaiine. And the ava is a spiritual drink of our people um, all around the world. It's also called kava in different parts of Polynesia. Mm-hmm. In Hawaii is, I believe, the only place that it's called ava. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in the intake of ava, it's a spiritual drink. It's an offering to our people. Um, and it's a beautiful drink to have exchange of conversation in. And so this is the reason why I brought this ava to actually be a ho'okupu and to be the mediator for, even in the words of the Messiah, right? He said that anywhere two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them. And so in our spiritual practice, we know that when there's two kanaka and there's the ava, akua is present with us. Like <laughs> so <laughs> I guess you have to drink some, huh? Eola, eola, <laughs> yeah. And what is a ho'okupu for people that don't know? So what ho'okupu that is? Um, is yeah. an offering, but it's not just any kind of offering. It's, it's um, um, it's an offering through what I was taught. Um, it's an offering that that actually plants a seed, that gives mana, um, that has a clear intention of being in relationship with, and that has the clarity of knowing that in every relationship, um, it's always all based on an exchange of uh, aloha and reciprocal love and peace. And so uh, ho'okupu in terms of ava is to bring this to help us to have equal ground, good, healthy relationship, and to start everything in a way of prayer, of connection, uh, peace, and love for everybody that is present. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, this is the perfect drink for me because I don't drink alcohol, <laughs> uh, but I do drink ava. <laughs> you do drink ava. <laughs> hey, 
All the kanakas who drink alpha all day, a good bar of mine say, no need be alcoholic. I used to be alcoholic. Be an alcoholic. <laughs> ah! <laughs> but everything in balance, everybody. Yeah, everything yeah, in balance. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And then, so this is how you drink it traditionally? So th- this is how we intake the alpha traditionally um, in Hawaii. It is always based um, um, through actually space of prayer. Um, a protocol and ceremony, really depending on the space and setting here, it's more of an exchange in a casual setting, but still has intention, uh, still has pono. So if you feel inspired and called, I could lead us into a little bit of intention setting. Yes, and, and definitely. We right well, let me, let me uh, just r- tell the people listening right now, um, maybe go to Spotify or YouTube so you can watch the visual feed so you can see what's going on instead of just listening to uh, it. Okay, so right now he's he's putting some of the ava into a coconut shell, and that's what we're using as bowls. The up cups. Oh, that looks good. Hey, mahalo. Hey, go. So he's, I got mine right there. Oh, this is a big bowl. This is a big bowl of alva, bro. And we drink them all at once. Huh? Yeah, so, so you just yeah, <laughs> tell, tell us how. Because before I had it, I would just sip on it. Like, yeah, what are yeah, you doing? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here in Hawaii, how we drink alva, and as I stated before... Um, you want to move is, the mic a little closer? Yeah. Um, and as I stated before, it's really all dependent on really space and setting. And so uh, in this space and setting, we really implement things that are kind of able to be more free, more liberated um, and clear in this space. But there are also other protocols and ceremony that is specifically to be used um, in a space that is private and sacred um, in the kapu time. And so in this, how we usually lead it is being able to have your left hand on the bottom because this is an expression of how um, mm-hmm. and being able to have the right hand on top, which is an expression of wa kea. This apu is you um, and all of the ava inside is your mana, is your spirit. So in, in putting your intentions Um, into this, it uh, clarifies that when you're putting this alva into you, that um, it becomes one with you. And you are therefore um, a speaker and a voice and an embodiment of our kupuna. Right on. So in that, hanu. Ah. Hanu. Ha. Hanu. Ha. And we, we actually put our index finger and thumb inside to give an acknowledgement to our kupuna who have come before us in the back of us, to our um, offspring and mo'opuna in the front of us, to all the kupuna in the lineage of our father on the right side and to all of our kupuna in the lineage of our mother on the left side. And we put one right over the piko i. And mahalo ki akua, no na mea apau, no ka mauli ola, no ka mana, no ka pono, no ka ho ala ki kanaka, ho ala kalahui. Mahalo i ki akua, e ola, inu. And we all do one clap. Oh, oh mahalo. I got this. Uh, oh. Mahalo i ki akua. Mahalo. Oh. That was my first time doing that yeah. in that sort of like way. Yeah, in that way. Before yeah. it's like uncle, whatever is kava bar. Just go <laughs> ta, 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 ta. <laughs> yeah, drink one. So <laughs> wow, yeah, that was good with the coconut water oh, too. Oh no, sweet. If yeah. I start acting a little different on the podcast, you know why? Oh yeah, you. <laughs> my my mouth's just uh, not cooperating. It's <laughs> super numb. <laughs> right on, mahalo for sharing that mm. with us. Even mm. for me, that was that was new for me, and like I've lived in Hawaii all my life, but I've I've, I've never been in too many. Uh, situation or environments where Ava was was drank and drink drunk, drank and what is the the right word Intake. when you when you never inu Ava I never yeah. inu <laughs> yeah so that's super cool Bye, all right mahalo. so now let, let's get started because we have a lot to get into yes. um that's an awesome way to start the podcast but I want to know about you I want to know where your ek your knowledge comes from but you know we also got to start at the beginning the kinohi where are you from? Where are you grad? And what was it like growing up? The start of spring welcomes Easter and Merry Monarch Festival. KTA Superstores is here for everything you need to celebrate what spring brings. From your local favorites, seasonal treats like marshmallow peeps, I love their marshmallow peeps, and chocolate bunnies, to complete meal solutions for Easter recipes, KTA is your one-stop shop. 
can't make it to the store? Visit them online at shop.ktasuperstores.com for their hand-picked favorites available for nationwide shipping. KTA has all you need to make your events one to remember. KTA Superstores, where you're someone special every day since 1916. Ooh, ah, uh, ooh. Uh, o ka ohana, uh, O ka mauna o pua waina, homestay papa kolea, uh, ka ohana uh, o makua kane. So all of my ohana on my father's side is from papa kolea, ani aniku street. Um, all the McShanes have been there. Um, and on our tutu side, um, our tutu kane was Hawaiian Portuguese, and he was a defreitis. And he, he is a defreitis. So all of my ohana on that side of Papu Kolea um, is Hawaiian Portuguese. On the McShane side, we also Hawaiian and have discovered we a little bit Spanish. Um, on our mom's side, Ka Ohana Omakua Hine, uh, she comes from the beautiful Ahupua'a um, of Kahalu'u, Mekane Ohe, um, the east side in uh, the beautiful district of Ko'olaupoko. Um, and so I kind of grew up in both areas, but I lived all my life um, in Waipahu. Mm. Um, and interesting because today has a connotation of it being like a Filipino uh, land in town. But not many people know that one of the most prestigious ali'i in our mo'olelo, uh, o kalani opu'u, or kale opu'u, um, he was born in Waipahu. No um, in in actually Alele Stream, which was right where I was raised, and I never mm. knew, um, but I always also had a deep connection to his mo'olelo, to his mana, as Klani Opu'u being one of the first people and ali'i to exchange in mana with, with Cook mm. um, in Hawaii Island, um, and the uncle to Kamehameha. Um, high school, uh, well, I currently live in uh, in the Ahupua'a um, of Pa'ala'a, in the district of Wailua. I live right in the beginning of Haleiwa town, super blessed. I'm, I'm actually the first one in my ohana um, for a long time to live back in Haleiwa, or Tutuhine, before they moved to Papakolea. Mm. They, they actually, she actually grew up with her and her twin um, in Haleiwa. Um, high school, big, big, awesome question. I went to St. Louis High School, or also known as Kalai Puhaku. Um, it is the first all-boys institution in the Hawaiian kingdom, um, established actually in the reign of Kamehameha III of Kawikeoli, um, 1846. So it's one of the oldest wow. schools um, in all of the Hawaiian kingdom. The oldest school to the west of the Mississippi, right, is Lahaina Luna. Um, and then only a few years after that is St. Louis. And so, and it used to be in Kaka'ako first, yeah. So well, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, so, so um, it was an all-boys institution as a college, and then the king actually gave a piece of land to all to to actually all the brothers who were in the Catholic Church and the Marianist tradition at that time in Kaimuki. And mm. so it's been up there for a long time. Um, and I'm a St. Louis grad, class of 11, and life growing up was amazing. You know, I uh, I think in a lot of ways I had a privileged upbringing um, in plenty ways, but that privilege also was, was um, a result and byproduct of two parents. They were very, very hardworking and had to put their whole life on the line for all of their kiki. And I never really understood it until now having a kiki and what it really takes. And I just have one, imagine having four all in private school and hustling and bustling um, to help your offspring to have the best education and life possible. Played sports all my life since I was three years old, all the way up into high school. Um, in my senior year in high school, in a little bit of a plug, our quarterback, our year, it was the first year that that we won the state championship mm -hmm. since 02. Who our quarterback that is year it? is Marcus Mariota, uh, yeah. who is also the quarterback now of the Atlanta Falcons. Um, he, he just got released, actually. He just got released. Yeah. Okay, so he free each. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. okay. But Marcus, you know, he's one of the best athletes to ever come out of mm -hmm. Hawaii. Um, and, and he's the first Heisman Trophy winner. And he, he was my good brother in high school. And I was his fullback that year. Um, oh, no and, way. And because he is an M in his last name, and I'm McShane, we were in the same homeroom uh, wow. <laughs> since eighth grade. So my good brother, my Marcus. So I got to have him next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think he stay home. Cause, I, saw, I saw that yeah, he's here, yeah, but yeah. I don't think he does podcasts. You never know. Speak to his I, agent. <laughs> no, no. I, I actually heard um, from 
somebody close to him that even like the Taylor Luans, one mm. of his teammates uh, at Tennessee Titans, Aye. he said he wasn't going to go on any podcast until after he retires. Wow. That, that's what I heard. I yeah. don't know. But well, I, he's, I smart. he's smart. He's yeah. smart. And his two parents also are amazing people mm-hmm. and they raised amazing boys. I, I used to see his parents. I worked at the uh, um, movie theater at Coco Marina in Hawaii. Oh, nice. And his parents would come in. Oh, yeah. And that was before he was drafted. And oh, actually, me. So funny story about uh, me and Marcus. Uh, I went to Sacred Hearts Prom. Oh, my when? Senior year. Uh, Who's your date? <laughs> Darcy Ibato. <laughs> Darcy Ibato. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, because he was dating a girl from Sacred Hearts, yeah, Nicole. I, yeah, I think he was dating Nicole that time. He was time. dating Nicole, and Darcy was this friends. This is hilarious. With, We're talking yeah. about Marcus. So, I love it. I love so, it. <laughs> it's funny because I didn't really know much because I'm from Big Island, but I went um, mm. my senior year on Oahu. Where? So, um, Kaiser. I oh, graduated Kaiser from Kaiser. Kaiser. So, I was senior year and I went to the junior prom with my friend Darcy. All right. And then she, her friend group was just friends with, like, <laughs> um, Nicole and Marcus was there. And I just heard, oh, this is the number one recruit. And I was just, like, this goofy, funny guy, yeah, just, yeah, like, super yeah. chill. Yeah, yeah. And, like, this is the vet, the the biggest recruit out of Hawaii. So we got a picture of, like, everybody in the, like, the friend group uh, at prom. And I think I'm the only one who kept it. <laughs> so I have it. Like, I have it at my house That's still. Awesome, and I always tell people, oh, yeah, I went to prom with Marcus Mario. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, because I even reposted and my friend that I went to prom with and even other, her other friend said, I think you're the only one who I has that picture. <laughs> That's funny, bro. And smart because, you know, they, they got um, playing cards or like collector cards, right? For yeah, all the yeah, sports yeah, athletes. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I get the, the I, original yeah, one-on-one prom, prom, prom <laughs> picture. Eba, and he's such a good human, Yeah, bro. he was so and, nice. And, you know, Eba, I'm super thankful <laughs> that... that um, he was in the right position at the right time and had a right group of people to uplift him and support him. And he deserved all of his success. And hey, we was so honored and proud um, to actually have him as being a son of Kalai Pohaku. And so, That's ma- awesome. Hey, bra- mahalo kia kua. Yeah. I didn't think you would be a St. Louis grad. Yeah. Interestingly <laughs> enough, you know, bro, Hawaiian, you know, my mom, she needed to put us into private school because she was, she was, she was afraid. She go, you know, my sons, they so cool. Eh? <laughs> bah, I go put them in public school, especially Kala. I go put them in public school. Oh, cause I don't know what, what, what he going to turn out to, you know, cause, cause her mom told her when I was like, Three years old, I wasn't even talking yet. I didn't talk till I was four. Now they kind of stopped talking now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Portuguese. I had a Portuguese, bro. But but she told my mom that you know he either gonna be the president of the United States or he, or, or he gonna be the head of the mafia. And <laughs> and hopefully I land more on the tick of the president. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So yeah. I can see that now because it's so funny. You're so good at turning this like. Pigeon local style talking and like professional mm. talk way of talking on and off because mm. you can be like, oh yeah I brought all and then you're like but today we are here <laughs> gathered you know you're you're so good at that uh, like uh, the little code switching uh, uh, but you know it was it's it's super interesting because um you know hey brother I take so much honor in how. I've learned to communicate because a lot of my life I've had a speech impediment. Mm. And so since I was young, actually, this was what I, you know, hardly even talk about. But it's such a big part of my story that if if I didn't have a speech impediment, I wouldn't be who I am today because I, I actually stuttered like pretty bad since I was about ever since I could talk because it, it was like I couldn't talk for a long time. Then when I want to talk, um, I was trying to think so fast mm. that the words couldn't keep up. Um, and so I learned how to cope with insecurity. I learned how to um, be in environments and adapt. And if you think about it, being a Hawaiian who loves to vala'au, who loves people, but always knows that when you're going to talk, there's a potential that people are going to um, have an opinion on you because you have a speech impediment. And if you don't know how to control that, it also becomes almost like a butt of everybody's joke, mm-hmm. right? And so I grew up with experiencing all of that, with with like a lot of people teasing me, um, uh, you know, have people in my ohana who would play around with me and tease me to... And they didn't really think anything of it, but it, it really affected me. Um, and I would, I would go into school and at the times in school where you say reading history book and you're going into the snake line that everybody has to read a paragraph or something, I would always go to the bathroom right, right when it was about to hit me because I wanted it to skip over me because when 
it would hit me. I would get so nervous because I, I could already see a reaction mm. from everybody that I'm going to read and I'm going to have such a tough time reading. And I never really had a hard time talking and conversation, but when I would read and think too much about it, it was as if I wasn't meant to speak from my head. Mm. I was always uh, instilled and created to speak from my heart. And I began to pick up cues that when I would speak from my heart on what what was intentional and and um, and like speak from a place of aloha and of purpose that the speech impediment would disappear. And so it put me on a path, like all of my personal development path had, had started because I was trying to discover um, how to speak better, how to communicate better. How can people listen to me and hear my voice? And I find that like today now when I'm almost 30, a lot of people are beginning to hear my voice. And it's because I've worked so long on how to be an expert communicator that it seems that, you know, like a person told me when I was, I was like 18, brah, I can already see you, brah. The thing that you taught was your handicap is going to be your superpower on mm -hmm. this planet. Yeah, keep going, hoi. Yeah. And now... It feels so good to be in the place. And you know, sometimes bugger come out because you know I just can't act. But but bro, eh, it's been such a beautiful uh, opportunity and blessing to hone in on this. And it's been a challenge a lot of my life, but we here, bro. Yeah, mahalo for sharing that. And I I think back to the saying like the thing that made you weird as a kid is what make could be the thing that makes, makes you, you special. <laughs> yeah, makes special you famous. as yeah, an adult. Special. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're such an articulate <laughs> speaker. And I would never have guessed that you had a speech impediment. So that's just goes to show how much work you put into oh, it. Oh, yeah, mahalo. Because it didn't just disappear overnight. You yeah. put the work into it. Oh, man, so know? much. And you I... had to deal with all of these, you know, struggles, insecurities. And mm -hmm. I'm sure they pop up every now and then, just like anything that, mm -hmm. you know, we've went through Aye. childhood trauma, past trauma, Aye. generational trauma. Aye. Like, it, it's all relevant in today's, today's world. But, yeah, that's so cool. I want to know, where did you get all your knowledge from? Like, how are you just so knowledgeable of, of all these these topics you're always posting these very educational reels mm -hmm. um and you know one you're you you communicate your manao very well so people want to listen mm -hmm. um but it's also very deep and profound and you, a lot of times you hit the nail on the head mm. you know it's like sometimes it's you're almost like a talking uh, puke olalo no ea ay, ay. and <laughs> like for certain issues that I see on Instagram, for example, the most recent one, um, Kaniela Ng, his son protesting at the Abraham Lincoln play. Not so, so long after, you had a video about that. Aye. And so, oh, I, but I had to jump on it. <laughs> but you know, I kind of seen it myself as almost yeah. a reporter now. You know, like yeah, jumping yeah. on it. You know, but like. that's nice because a lot of times these things happen in Hawaii, and we want to hear a different side of the story or a different perspective, not just like the news. We're here at Abraham Lincoln Middle yeah, School yeah, and yeah, yeah, this yeah. happened and blah, yeah, blah, blah, yeah. or just a video with no explanation. So it's nice to have a voice, Aye. you know, um, kind of like this platform. Um, but a, another quick form, just Instagram, you can just see something, make a make a story about it, make a post about it, and then you have the, you, dis, you dis, disseminate information. Aye, aye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, brother, I, I seen that when I was getting on this path of speaking, um, I actually started as a professional speaker when I was 18 years old. And so when I came out of high school and I was bodybuilding, I was really inspired. Oh, we got to talk about that too. Oh, yeah, Sorry, we will, we will, we So... In that time, I was really inspired uh, to empower people, and I still am. Um, I'm always empowering people with with everything that I got, you know, because because I wouldn't be who I am if I never had people that were in my corner or just a video that could empower me, you know, to really see who I am, see me as Akua sees me, you know, be able to see me as like. Um, a little three-year-old boy who could look up at an 18-year-old and be like, you know, you know, hey, he's making a difference and I look up to him. Um, and, and so, bro, I started going through a lot of um, education and training in professional speaking and ways of communication, but they were more so teaching the mechanics mm -hmm. of communication, you know, because there is a way to speak um, on the mechanic side and then there is an art form of communication that you have to be tuned in spiritually, 
um, intuitively in order to know how to say something at what particular time so that what you're communicating is going to get through. Because if it doesn't get through because of one thing you say, then it turns the consciousness off f- from being quote unquote influenced. And, and as people of influence, which we all are, um, I learned early on in business and speaking that, that if you're going to get good at anything, you get good at people. How do you get good at people? You have an understanding of their needs, of their wants, of their desires, and you do what you can from the best place possible to meet those needs and with what you have to offer. And so every time, um, like speaking and communicating, I try to do my best to do that on the art form side, on the mechanic side, um, on the intelligent side. That's that's a whole other thing because um, I've studied a wide range of topics mm-hmm. because early on I was so interested in truth. I wasn't interested in like a person's perspective on something if it didn't resonate. You know, um, there's. There's plenty of people who are great motivational speakers, but what you're going to state in one audience, in one place, if it's only for that particular niche, it doesn't always mean that that it's going to be universal for all people. So that if people listen to it, they're going to be like, at any time of life, anywhere you are, uh, any place and situation you are in life, if what you're stating doesn't apply, I've learned that it's not truth. So a teacher of mine told me, old, old Asian man, uh, my good man, uh, my teacher and sensei, probably one of the most influential men in the past eight to 10 years of my life. Um, he told me to always speak from a place of truth. And when I asked him, what does that mean, truth? Um, how do I speak from, from, from truth all the time? He's like, you have to make sure that what you are saying applies all the time everywhere for everyone um, in every situation it can always apply because in because embedded and integrated in what you are speaking about is universal truths that always always exist at all times you speak from that place and always have the intention that what um, how it's going to be delivered is going to be to the benefit of you of that other person of the audience and of all of humanity when you speak with that power, that what you're saying is always applicable, is always truthful, it's always based on what um, is universal for all people, then you stand in a position of power that your words now really carry power and influence. It carries weight. Because you're not just giving an opinion. You, you actually become a voice of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he told me that. And I was like, true. And I was already on that path. And so today I try to to still instill that and to do that in all of my communication. Uh, Always keeping in mind past, present, future, past, present, future. Because, you know, if I'm speaking on an issue that has to do with all the history of our kupuna, it has to relate to now or else it's not going to get ingested. And it kind of get communicated in a way that, that is so hyper-emotional, which I see is almost a tendency for a lot of our indigenous people on the rise. Um, a lot of our Kanaka speakers have a tendency to be really, really um, emotional in how they deliver. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, people, people take it as aggressive. Yeah, they mm-hmm. see it as aggressive because potentially in one way or the other it is. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be in the tone. It could be in the expression. You know, it could be in the volume, right? And so, but I've learned that if you speak in that particular way, it's not going to resonate for everybody. If you want to have the highest probabilities of influence, make sure you communicate in a way that everybody is able to ingest um, to process and then make it so simple that they can apply it now. Mm. Then you know you're empowering people into action. So that's what I try to do as best as I can. I try to do my best to plant seeds as much that it, that is going to be actually put into Aina Momona that mm-hmm. it's going to grow. And I'm not going to plant seeds on the rock or on the thorn and the baga 
<laughs> ah, you're wasting energy, honey. Mm-hmm. You know, put them on the line. No. That is a good, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't plant seeds where there's one rock. So on yeah, the concrete. Honey, don't you don't like, do that. Yeah, don't, don't hope for the, the rose that bloomed through the concrete. Just find the good patch of Aina and then <laughs> yeah. have a whole rose garden. <laughs> and pray before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so are you really religious? Is that, what was your upbringing like? So, um, let me expand. Like, in the Hawaiian culture, like you said, you educated yourself, but was that prevalent um, for you growing up? Religion, culture, etc. Yeah. So, so all of my ohana, um, the half of my ohana um, in Kahalu um, and Kaneohe, um, all predominantly Catholic mm-hmm. um, and private school. On my papakolea side, Adventist public school, mm. Roosevelt High School. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, my dad always told me, "Who, oh, bah." Eh, has a few, you know, uh, has a handful of awesome people in the world. Um, and all the rest is private school. He goes like, and he goes like, I'm a daddy. <laughs> and, and he always banked on, eh, hey, bah, he loved his school. Rough Rider, he class at 83, my daddy. And mm-hmm. so, um, so in terms of um, spiritual influence in my life early on, um, I went to private school all my life, so I was always around the church. But we weren't ever in Ohana to go to church on Sunday, mm-hmm. right? So I never went to church on Sunday. I went to church every day in school, mm-hmm. right? And so things at St. Louis, uh, I went to a Christian school in Kaneohe, and it was all based around, you know, uh, like things and practices that had to do with the church. But one of the main things that I find is absent in a lot of our public schools is very much clarity on the values that that is um, inherently human and to the betterment of all. And every tradition, as I went on my whole spiritual journey, every tradition around the planet has these common values, meaning it's universal, meaning it applies for all people. And if we apply them, then it leads to prosperity for all. And so today... Um, in terms of spiritual practice, I wouldn't consider myself to be religious because the implication of being religious is confined to a system um, because all of these spiritual cultures are confined to a particular traditional thought that has a school of thought, right? And so the school of thought of Christianity, it comes out of the consciousness of the Christ. Um, hopefully, it comes from the Christ um, instead of the apostles. It comes mm-hmm. directly from the Christ, which a lot of the church today is built on the messages of Paul and not really the messages of Yahushua HaMashiach, who is a Messiah. If you go to Buddhism, it's based on the consciousness of Buddha. If you go into Hinduism, it's based on the consciousness of Krishna, right? And so, but when you look at it, you can see that they were all talking about the same things. And so I've learned that instead of being uh, too confined mm-hmm. to one tradition, to one persuasion, to one cultural thought. Looking at the universal principles that apply to all humans and um, and being able to speak and, and to spread a message that unifies all, because mm-hmm. it seems like our biggest divider is not only religion, but also business, and they pour into each other, right? And so if we can take these healthy values, like in the time of Kalakaua, he was a capitalist. He was a capitalist, Kalakaua. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know. He was, he was an opportunist, an uh, innovator, um, a powerful Ali. But he was, he was also Christian. And what he tried to do was make the first kind of capitalism that, that had been existing at that time by fusing the, the actually Christian values to make it ethical. Because he's seen that if you don't have ethics in capitalism, then it's destructive and it destroys people when it's supposed to be working for people. Right. And so he fused that. So I try to do my best to do that. Right. It's like being an entrepreneur, being being an innovator, um, a thought leader, if you want to say that, and to blend that with all the universal values that resonates with all people and then have that root be Hawaii, Mm -hmm. have that root be Hawaii so that when I go plant them anywhere, Mm -hmm. you know, like... uh, I'm not planting on avocado tree. I'm planting on galo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? And so, yeah, yeah, that's it, bro. Okay. So... Would you consider yourself more agnostic or just you don't like to put labels on so, it? So, um, yes and no. Um, I consider me to be a universal spiritualist of aloha. Mm. So I am actually introducing 
our work in Awaken the Aloha um, is based on teaching people the way of Aloha. Mm -hmm. And the way of Aloha came to me one day in ceremony on when, when I was asking Akua and Kupuna, how can we bring our people to a more spiritually unified front? Because it seems like a lot of our people in the Lahui, you have a huge portion of our people that are still churched, mm -hmm. that um, are still involved in the Christian faith, which has no problem with it, right? It, it, it's absolutely amazing, depending on how you approach it. And then on the other hand, a huge portion of our people are culturalists. And then on the other hand, you know, maybe like a third of our people are not involved in any of them, right? And so... I wasn't really interested in being involved in either because I had experience in both. And I seen that both had limitations. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see what was needed to bring all the values of Christianity and the practices of our kupuna mm -hmm. and to mesh them. And then when I went on my studies of the Manahuna people and uh, the ancient times pre-Pa'au, pre-Tahiti, mm -hmm. and how our people only had one akua. There's a lot of misconceptions about that too. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so things in the church, they're trying to integrate Hawaiian culture by bringing Io into the picture as one akua to convert Hawaiians. Yeah. Who, which one was the false god from Tahiti? Which one was that? Well, there was, um, so, so in the coming of Pa'au, through the Mo'olelo that I know, in the coming of Pa'au, he brought the kapu system and all the four main gods mm -hmm. and all the houses of Kane, of Kanaloa, of Ku, of Lono, um, and had persecuted all the people who were here before who had believed only in Io. Mm -hmm. and, and the people that only believed in Io they didn't really have a fully established hierarchy system that, that in this time of Pa'au, he wanted to instate. He wanted to instate this hierarchy system um, to actually bring the, all of the chiefly lines, the highest of the Ali'i. So he went down a little bit. He brought back Pili to instate him as being the first Ali'i. And you can see all the lines that had came from that. But that was controlled by such strict kapu that a lot of our people who were there before, they either had to integrate into that or they were going to be persecuted mm. and killed, right? And so what I'm trying to do, my man, is bring this consciousness of Io and the consciousness of the people of Tahiti with... um all the lehu lehu, or na akua, all the kini akua, to blend them both because one is all and all is one. Mm -hmm. And so if those akua is not io and io is not that akua, then you're never going to have oneness. Yeah. But if you can bring the both of them in and see it from a perspective that io is the all-encompassing um, expression of the divine creator and is embodied in the multitude of personalities, in the multitude of deity that are of our Kanaka culture, mm -hmm. that that can have the the uh, the perfect blend yeah. on how to have a spirituality that is all encompassing, that is unifying, and that is still rooted in what is Pono in, in Hawaii. Yeah, I love that you say that because I've had this uh, a conversation with some some other people about like. We talk about religion. I mean, I mean, religion and politics are probably the two most divisive things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it's I don't feel like we're we're able to talk about religion as much freely with just friends because like, oh, you don't believe in the one true God, you're wrong. Yeah, you yeah, know that yeah. that's how it is. Where it's like, okay, <laughs> but like you said, there's so many similarities within the values, and for example, like when you're when you're saying, Mahalo ke Akua, mm. thank you God. Like, which God are you saying that to? Mm, mm. Is, is it an all-encompassing God? Is it the Christian God, the Catholic God? Is it Buddha? Is it Krishna? Like, Aye. you know, it, who is it? And, and who's to say who is right? Is who what I is to say who is yeah. right? Nobody, mm -hmm. right? Um, I try to have the consciousness that is is universal but makes sense right i think that uh, like a lot of people that get involved in a religious system a religious culture they're getting involved in it because they're seeking something mm -hmm. right and so yet once they're beginning to seek something they they actually intentionally or unintentionally assimilate into a particular culture, mm -hmm. which it, it, if people are interested in being Buddhist, you're automatically are going to get exposed to Asian cultures and all 
of the wide offspring of Buddhism across Asia. Um, every time I'm speaking of Akua um, in our three pillars and three principles of our work in the way of aloha is aloha aina, aloha akua, aloha kanaka. Aloha akua is, is all-encompassing um, because everything is akua. Because although people can say that uh, this computer was made by Steve Jobs, okay, you go break them down. What is the screen made out of and what is everything else made out of inside there? You're going to say crystal, you're going to say chips, you're going to say steel, you're going to say cobalt, you're going to say different stuff that is a part of the computer. Okay, who, who, and who created the cobalt? Who created all of that? So the Apple computer is a configuration of of all the elements that were already pre-existing. And so everything that existed since the beginning of time, it, it actually says in the, uh, in the book of e Ecclesiastes um, that there's, there is nothing new under the sun. So everything that we make is just a combination and configuration mm -hmm. of different things that was already here. Um, and so the consciousness of man takes something that, that was already created through the consciousness of Akua, the one source, that is the first, the last, and all in between, um, always existing, um, always has a presence. They say that the three characteristics of Akua is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. So all-knowing, all-powerful, all places at all times. So if it's not that, it cannot be the source. But everything is that. Mm. <laughs> this is some good topics right? to I hope people are listening to this and I hope they're the wheels in their brain are turning and they're having conversations with their friends and yes. family about this. Bruh, cause we're living in a time of a massive spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful thing that um I I believe everybody can see right now. We're living in a spiritual awakening time. We just entered into the age of Aquarius, which is told to be um each age is told to be about 2,000 years. The last age was the age of Pisces. The beginning of the age of Pisces, you know who was born. It was the Messiah. And so, and that had dictated that full 2,000 years of influence on the planet. Now, we're moving into this deeper stage of enlightenment mm -hmm. that people are getting awakened to other forms of spiritual practice. Just make sure that your spiritual practice, which I encourage everybody, everybody's going to go on their own spiritual path. I try to encourage people in our work, which is a fundamental part of our work, is to identify the, the, the ancestral practices that your kupuna had and to look for the best of the best stuff that was closest to the light that is closest to unity because we can see in all of our indigenous cultures you know there's always an existing of duality so you're always going to have the light but you're also going to have the couple mm -hmm. and and what comes with that couple and um so to keep me i wouldn't say keep away but try to put your energy your focus your intention into that which brings unity what brings love what brings peace within and without yeah whether that be God, the universe. Anything. Whatever. That's all labels and terms. Yeah. Yes, Love exactly. your neighbor, as Akua said. <laughs> love Akua. Love the source. Love your Aina. And love each other. Because love is the expression of the one, mm -hmm. the, the one true divine. Yes. is love. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Mahalo so much for sharing that. Speaking of love, which is translated to Aloha. Aloha has a lot of meanings. Aye. Um, I, I really want you to break down some words and some definitions for us because I really re respect your opinion and your manao. And I would love for our audience to hear like the, the not so much the etymology, but like the history of certain words and how you define them. For example, aloha, mm. aloha. Mm. We, some people may have heard that. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you explain to them that? Yes. Um, so what is aloha? aloha, many people, uh, if you've heard of Hawaii, usually the word that comes to mind immediately is aloha. You know, meeting people in Rome, meeting people in the Philippines, once they hear that I'm from Hawaii, they go, oh, aloha. <laughs> you know, because it's been uh, quote unquote commercialized and trademarked around the world. So people only think it's a greeting. Yeah. Um, and it. It, it is a greeting. What I learned first is that aloha is a verb before a noun. Um, that the concept of aloha, when you break it down, and I try to apply all of this in every realm and dimension possible, beginning with the self. So when you're looking at alo and ha, you, you have alo, makolelo, hawaii, alo is present. 
Um, it is face. It could also be aura because your presence exudes your physical body. Um, ha is the breath of life. But what is the breath of life? I ask people. They go, huh? What? I go, it has to be the essence of life because if you're not breathing, then there's no life in the vessel, which then means it's the evidence of life that ha is the clearest evidence that you are alive and that you are present, meaning that if you're connected to your breath and you're breathing correctly, then you are more in harmony and in sync with how you are supposed to be in an organic and natural state, yeah, um, in breath and in spirit. So then I say, if I pull out one gun and I shoot you and you weigh 185 pounds in one moment and then your breath leaves you, I weigh you, you weigh 185 pounds again, then that means that that which you are cannot be in your physical body because you're gone. So, so who you are has to be in connection to your breath. It's the part of your being that is invisible to the human eye um, if you are not tuned in to all of your spiritual intuition and connection. And so in aloha, it could literally mean, if you're applying it to yourself, if you take it literally, in the presence of your breath, in the presence of spirit, in the presence of akua. And so... Which means that if people are called to get in the presence of Akua, one of the best ways they can do it is come into the presence of their own breath mm -hmm. and to connect to that mana. Um, yet, as a verb, as, as in action, um, it is a reciprocal exchange of this mana. It's a reciprocal exchange. Not all people have aloha for you. And I've had to learn that my hard way. Because not all people understand what it means to be in reciprocal relationship with another person. They have been conditioned to be in a relationship where they automatically expect something. They, they, they actually take before they give. Mm -hmm. They are trained that way. Not all people have that aloha. But people of Hawaii, the people of our kupuna, inherently, I, I feel we don't even need to be conditioned this way anymore. Because our DNA remembers it, we have it in us. So when I'm speaking about aloha as a verb, I'm speaking about this, this exchange of relationship that is reciprocal, that is balanced, and that is filled with, with life, with love, and with mana. As a noun, people always say, aloha is love. Okay, but what kind of love? Because get plenty of ways for love. People love their dog. People love their pizza. People love their partner. People love their mom and their dad in different forms of love. Mm -hmm. So what is the love we're talking about that aloha is? I say aloha akua. Yeah. It's the kind of love that only akua can give um, effortlessly, ever going and eternally to its offspring. And it's, I say, because akua is neither a he or a she. It's a it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's both. And so... I learned, especially having a son now, it's the kind of love that if you have a child, you will know this, um, that it's the kind of love that, that you have for your offspring, that they're one with you that they're your seed, they came from you, they're your manna, and therefore they're your responsibility um, to help them in the way they should go to the betterment and contribution of their highest good. Always working in the favor of their highest good. Mm -hmm. So in the way that I define aloha as a form of love is unconditional, empathetic, compassionate, understanding, strong, resilient, truthful, and everlasting love. The, the kind of love that you can only have for a thing that you are one with. Hmm. Wow, that's, that, that's the most poetic definition of love I think I've oh, ever Oh, mahalo kia kumba. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> eola, eola, yeah. eola. <laughs> okay, uh, next, next question before we get into Instagram question. One word we hear a lot as well, haole. Mm. Some people break it down as ha, ole which I hear was a misconception. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard different stories. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, ha is the breath, Aye. breath of life. Ole means nothing. So Aye. some people say that haoles are, you know, people without breath. Mm. Or another story was like they they thought white people were ghosts Aye. and they didn't have breath. Yeah, they didn't have breath. That's they? why it was <laughs> ha ole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but I've heard it. It was never broken into two words like that. It mm. was just howling. Howling, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also heard on Mo'olelo of one of the Kanaka who was um, engaged in that, that big altercation with all of the crew members of Captain Cook, and he went throw one pohaku. Because, you know, our Kanaka, wow, they were art, wow, they were, they were freaking marksmen, hoi. <laughs> but they, they strong Kanaka, they get mean aim, and he, and he went throw one pohaku, and one hit one of the crew members in his po'o, and the guy went fold, oh. and he went over to the guy and he'll listen and he'll stand up and said hmm. uh, so I heard that mo'olelo too which is interesting um, I think it's a mo'olelo that actually came out of Kepalino um, I think so um, but I try my best to think objectively okay right so what if it's just haule mm-hmm. okay haule as in Hua olelo means things that are foreign, things that are just not Maoli, yeah. um, things that are not of Hawaii, which can be anything, right? If any, this camera is haole, mm-hmm. you know, Laptop, all the trees, microphone. yeah, all is haole, right? Yeah. And so if that's the concept that we're looking at, then I don't feel there's too much of a lesson there. Um, but what if we, we choose to look at it as haole? Yeah, what if? Um, because that that is a part of how our people define haole and how they relate to it being a white-bodied person. And I say a white-bodied person because that is um, th- the way to communicate now in a way that is uh, compassionate and trauma-informed. You know, um, it's not just a white person. Yeah, everybody can call a white person, but a white-bodied person actually takes them from from being almost like a target to identifying and relating that their bodies just look different, mm-hmm. but they're still human. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if we can say ha'ole as being empty of breath, how can we unpack that, right? So we have ha'ole no breath, um, which as I just explained could also mean no spirit. Um but everybody has a spirit, everybody has a breath. So what kind of spirit are we talking about? It has to be that... We're talking about the spirit that is not like the spirit of Hawaii. It has mm-hmm. to be the spirit that that is not of aloha. Mm-hmm. It, it has to be the spirit that is not one with the consciousness and the values of our people. What are the consciousness and values of our people? Everybody can know. Our people have a value system that is so unique. That is the reason why people love Hawaii. People love Hawaii, yeah, for all the sites, but people love Hawaii because of our people. But it seems like things in the commercial realm has tended um, to put, you know, be in favor of Hawaiian culture, but not in favor of Hawaiian people, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. the culture, the people, and the aina is one. Yeah. And so I've seen that if you were to say how ole, it could mean that, that you not one with the values that are the universal values of Hawaii, of the people of Hawaii, mm. people that are of aloha. And if you don't have that, then that comes out and expresses itself in so many ways. You see, the people that came from the Western world to Hawaii, they had a different value system. They didn't see the world or how Kanaka saw the world. And they operated and acted and treated us as they saw the world. And we treated them as we saw the mm-hmm. world. You hear stories of Cook getting adorned in the Ahuula, in the Mahi Ole, in all of the many offerings of Ho'okupu that our kupuna gave to them. But it was never reciprocal and we could see that that also plays a part in the consciousness of american society today and even in the western world that the values that lay at the foundation of the western world once they got away from being a committed people in a country to god to akua then people seem to have gone astray and forget the real values that make us human, that thrive. And when those values are absent, then all of the inferior qualities of the human starts to creep in. Things like greed, things like lust, things like envy, things like hatred. All of these things that our masters talked about, yeah, that you need to kind of try mm-hmm. to do your best to ward off envy, ward off um, hatred, ward off evil, ward off lust. Because these things, they, they go in opposition to the spirit. And when you want to live in spirit, then all of those things may propose itself to you. But if you know how to build yourself up enough, then you can ward them off. But when the connection to aloha and the inherent values that is of our kupuna are gone, then we begin to assimilate into another value system. And that value system is absent 
of Aloha. It's mm. absent of breath. It doesn't care about everybody. This is why you see these these huge divides between like um, houselessness and people who are coming to Hawaii, who are multimillionaires investing in real estate. You have this divide. If people had the consciousness of aloha for all to thrive, then we wouldn't have houselessness, like the Hawaiian kingdom, no houselessness. Mm -hmm. we, we would have no drug addiction because the aloha would reign supreme. And how we can measure how we are doing as a society in Hawaii is to measure how much people are living in aloha. Because if we don't measure that, then we can, and we're only highlighting the crime, and we're only highlighting all the bullshit, that comes because people don't have any guidance, then you create more of that. Mm. If we can create a media network that only focuses on aloha and the good that our community is doing, then we send that impulse of information to the community, then this concept of haole, it would be so very clear because you'll be able to point out a person that is not living correctly mm -hmm. and is treating somebody bad. And you can step in and give them your aloha if that's your call in that moment. Mm. Yeah? That is so good. I was just thinking as you were breaking it down, maybe a haole person, in my definition, it was always somebody who, you know, doesn't act like people from here mm. who are, I mean, in foreign, mm. you know? But now that I'm thinking about it, what if it was just how how haole people are just people with aloha ole, with no aloha. With, yes, yes. And yes. maybe I wonder, this is just, this is me throwing out, this is a stretch is that aloha ole kind of may got formed into haole. It, it could be. I mean, just take away the alo, you got Aye. haole. Aye. Aloha ole, haole. Hey. And it's yeah. the beautiful thing of being our people, um, you know, and always implementing everywhere in your life, like uh, the practice of makavalu, mm -hmm. and always seeing things from different perspectives all the time, that... Um, one of the things of the Western world that is clear um, in how they think is a lot of the thought processes of the Western world is linear. Mm -hmm. It always sees things as a for or against, as a black and white, as this is right and this is wrong. This is Republican, this is Democrat. Yeah, this is liberal, this is non-liberal. You know, we're, we're uh, like seeing that there's always only seems to be a two choice thing all the time. Yeah. That's too linear. Because, A, if you're talking about things that have to do with, like, pro-choice, then it makes sense where all people autonomously should have a decision over aspects of their life. Depending on the situation, yeah, you have to make the decision that is most appropriate for that situation. It may not be the same as this, right? Because it's not the same. It's different. It. Uh, takes a different approach on how to find a solution to that problem than this problem. So thinking in a way that, you know, it's another way to see truth is truth is not truth until it can be confirmed through eight different perspectives. Hmm. And that's what Makavalu is. That's, that's a good perspective. Right? That's a good Makavalu. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But yeah, just stuff to think about. I, I love it when we're able to question things. Yeah. And it, we don't question it because we necessarily looking for that at least for me i'm just speaking to me i just want to know other opinions uh, how other people are thinking it's to be curious of it yeah. and to create the space where curiosity is not um um a punishment mm -hmm. yeah. yeah where being curious is a good thing and knowing how to ask the questions because i see a lot of foreigners coming to hawaii who want to learn culture but they don't know how to ask the question that is appropriate yeah, yeah. and so um yeah let's mock a value on all right back from a shishi break <laughs> i think the uh, the ava, the ava went right through me <laughs> <laughs> okay so these are the you're someone special instagram questions presented by kta Guni Bird Farm wants to know what else can we do to save HB995 and midwifery? Um, before you answer that, can you just tell people what HB99955 is? Uh, yeah, so HB955 is a bill that w we are trying to pass right now for all the birth workers here in Hawaii, specifically pertaining to midwifery and home birthing. Uh, this bill is going to protect the traditional practices of midwifery um, here in Hawaii. If, if it doesn't pass, then... 
all of the home birth practitioners could be up for legal repercussions in their practice. Um, if I'm not mistaken, what is happening in HB 955 is that the the uh, state house is um, is trying to create almost like a regulation um, of a process that all home birthers need to go through before practicing, which in traditional midwifery didn't exist because how you learn is makahana kaike. You, you, you learn. You learn on the job, Hawaiian. You learning on the job and you studying at the same time. And, and so this bill is going to protect the practices of traditional midwifery specifically um, in Hawaii and to allow our home birthers the actually freedom of, of space, the um, autonomy to practice without any repercussions. And I see that as a powerful thing because personally, we had a home birth of our son. Mm -hmm. um, and our team at Halekiala Ula was phenomenal. And we only experience fear off the bat when actually going into our appointments with our OBGYNs. Uh, good guys, you know, but they come out of a different school of thought, right? They come out of a different school of thought and they think a certain way, which I'm not going to blame anybody for thinking the way they think, bro. That's how they think. I'm not going to convince them either because they're all in their 40s. So it's like they, they already have a paradigm that is locked into a specific way. But I advocate for the fact and being an MC and being on a team of organizers of our protest yesterday and the rally, I heard a person say in a TEDx talk on reproductive rights that because this issue is not a, a, a home birth issue um, at large. Its main core issue is reproductive rights and the right to choose. Mm -hmm. And that already half of our state house reps and the Senate um, have agreed on paper that they are in advocacy and are for actually pro-choice and and have committed to the protection and advocacy of women's rights. And mm. this, this, yes, is a home birth bill, yes. But when you look at it, it's more so of a choice bill. Yep. It's actually giving our women the, the opportunity to choose who they want to give birth with, where they want to give birth. Because it's terrifying to give birth in the hospital if you don't like the hospitals, dog. And the hospitals don't have an you know, inviting environment all the time. It's scary, mm -hmm. right? And so the best place that we found to have your kiki is have them right where you're going to raise them. Mm -hmm. Have them in your hale. We have a little cottage in Hale Eva that we've been living in for a couple years. And our son was born right on our wooden floor in our kitchen. Awesome. And I caught him. And our experience with all of our midwives and our doulas was so phenomenal that it was my responsibility. It, will, it, it was my kuleana to use my platform uh, to speak on this yeah. and, and to share and, and to know that everybody, this affects everybody, not only birth workers, this affects your daughters. If they're going to choose to reconnect to their culture and choose to bring that in with how they have their offspring. Yeah, because how Akupuna did it, we didn't need any any of the devices or anything to ho'oulukalahui and ho'ohanao kikeiki. Never need any of that. Yeah, and so I say, hey, if you want to get closest to your kupuna, one of the best practices that you can implement as, as, as future parents is to decide to have a home birth mm -hmm. and, and to not even expose your keiki to the hospital environment. Yeah. And you know, my son, he never been in one hospital Hawaii. <laughs> Hopefully it stays like that. <laughs> for a, a really long time, yeah. My my brother and sister in law they're pre um, preparing for home birth. Beautiful. At the end of March or a, um, beginning of April. Amazing. So I mean, sorry I couldn't uh, come to the the rally no, at the Capitol. All good, bro. All good. Um, but I I definitely support you know the the choice that women right. can make. I mean. I, that's kind of a, to me when I heard about it and I looked into it's it. It's kind of nuts, like, yeah. <laughs> how does that even make sense? Yeah. You're telling somebody you can't do something at your own hale. But this this <laughs> this is how the governments work, right? It's crazy. And to me. one of the craziest things is to think that that men men are making these decisions. Yeah. For yeah. women. Yeah, yeah, and it's been like that for It's a been really like that for time. so long. And that's why these things need to change because we need to create a generation of kane, which is a part of our work in men's work, create a generation of kane that are conscious, that are heart-centered, that are mm -hmm. tuned in. And not all kane aren't tuned in because there were 
some good house reps that came down speak to mm -hmm. us and they they were great you know but at large this is like a systematic issue that people think in this manner do you want to call out anybody ah <laughs> no, not me not me you try anybody on the bus right there? <laughs> I got Rebbe Yamashita and Scott Psyche bro all we're asking brother Scott is to bring this to the table bring it to the table yeah let everybody do a house vote on this if you can allow them to do a house vote on this then let everybody that is in the government, all 51 seats to make a decision of if this is going to pass. Because we can see that this is going to put everybody to the test of what they said on paper, that they're, they're in favor of women's rights and reproductive rights. They can vote on this and make it a choice. And you got to Thursday to do it. So mm -hmm. we're going to post this and you're going to see it and you're going to bring it to the floor, my man. Please. Mm -hmm. Mahalo nui. Yes, definitely. Uh, it... It's really exciting to hear people's passion for these bills trying to pass. I see Brenton Awa Aye. doing a lot of things, but it's also very discouraging at the same time when he posts those trials or I don't know what hearings, what would you call yeah. them? Yeah, 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 yeah whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he like trying to pass some bills. One was for, I, I don't remember, the, the most recent one I saw was such a simple bill, just allowing people to practice, to wear aloha. Yeah, to have an aloha shirt. Aloha shirt. Any every day. day. Yeah. Every day of the week. Aloha Friday every day. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, wow, this is so cool. So cool. Why, why wouldn't we just, everybody just agree with that? Yeah. And then he's like, everybody, please, I, I ask you to just leave your hand down and let this bill pass. They put it to a vote. Everybody's hand go up yeah. to deny it. Yeah. And you can see that that gives you a perfect example of how people see our culture mm -hmm. in government. Yeah, and how a majority of people that are lawmakers in Hawaii have never been cultured. They are, you know, a majority is Asian population in the Hawaiian government. And that's not bad at all. But what I'm saying is when your consciousness is not cultured and if your consciousness is not attuned to where you are, and why you are, and the appreciation of where you are, and to know that if you were born here, that you are kama'ino Hawaii ne, that you have a kuleana to Hawaii. This is your birthing sense, not China or Asia or anywhere else you come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your roots come to Hawaii. Yeah, and the keepers of this aina um, have a culture that is here to unify you and to invite you and to bring you in. So when it's something small like having. Aloha Friday every day, it seems like, oh, that's such an easy thing. But you know how much people have never had an Aloha shirt on because they don't even feel that it, it's appropriate. Or how come we should pass this? It's going to give Hawaiians too much power. Yeah, kind of thing like that. Or right? it's, it's going to be unprofessional and we're not going to look like Americans, yeah. like Western society. So Hawaii, yeah. do it anyway. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> With so, love. So before we move on to the next question, what what is a simple answer? I mean, it's not simple, but what is an answer that you have for us to save HB 995? So the easiest action plans is to go on the Instagram that is called at Pacific Birth Collective. There is a petition there that you can sign um, on change.org. If you can get that position in, we are already at, I think, over 30,000 signatures mm -hmm. that is in favor of this. If you are an influencer, if you are a person of influence, I encourage you to advocate for this. If you need more research, just shoot me a DM at SON of Oahu or ask any of the birth workers in the community at a post there. And third, reach out to your, your actually state representative um, of your district and just advocate for it. It takes you five minutes to do this. Just shoot them an email and say, mm -hmm. I um, am in advocacy and support of HB 955. I appreciate that you passed it mm -hmm. on behalf of the people. Mahalo. Right on. Mahalo. I just feel like that's such a dumb thing. And I'm like, again, you're just not allowing somebody to do something at their own house. That's ridiculous. I know, it's not true. Anyways, that's the life we live, the the world we live in. Hey, um, you know, had had this teacher that I said, uh, well, who actually said this at our rally yesterday, bro, was, you know, to add a little bit of a plug um, to the head of Mana'ai, Uncle Daniel Anthony, mm -hmm. he said that, that if you wasn't in the bed when I was making them, 
then you don't need be in my bed while it's being burst. <laughs> you almost had a, a, his voice a little bit too. Yeah. <laughs> if you wasn't in the bed while, while I was making them, then you're not going to be in the bed while it's coming out. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I've been trying to get him on the podcast too. We're just trying to work on the schedule. He, he, he'll be a good guy to yes. talk to. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Next question comes from Michele Hallelu33. He wants to know, did he ever read the book Perpetuated in Righteousness by Daniel Kikawa? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I read that puke as well as his other puke he came out with after that, which is called um, Okeakua Ikeo, uh, Okeo, Okeakua, uh, Okeakua Okapo, mm-hmm. um, that had spoke about the history of Pa'au, uh, the coming... Um, of a new system and then the coming of Christianity and how our people at that time, you know, when you really think about in the time of Kamehameha and, and you know, the introductions of Christianity to Hawaii is one of the most pivotal points in our history, um, you know, because the overthrow of the Kapu system, 1819, after the passing of Kamehameha, you, you, you see a lot of the, the influence of the church getting into Hawaiian government. Yeah. Um, yet what isn't always uh, considered in the Hawaiian mind is that the biggest advocates of this were our Ali'iwa Hine. And one of the reasons why there were such big advocates of this from what I've learned is because they were seeing it as a more peaceful um, spiritual practice and that the kapu system had um, encaged them a lot of their life, had limited them on who they could be, on what they could do, and that they were confined to this particular way of life in the status of an ali'i vahine. But, and then in the coming of Christianity, they also seen that as being like an opportunity for a new way. Mm. But they didn't really fully see the long-term repercussions that it could have on our people. And so in reading this book, which is an amazing read, um, the two of his books, I absolutely encourage it. Um, it empowers the Christian perspective um, in Hawaii. Because it, you know, it does take a stance almost that because our people were were only believers in one akua io iolani e, um, and then the couple system came for a, for almost a thousand years, and then the introduction of Christianity came. That that the concept of io is the same akua in the Bible. Hmm. Absolutely, it's the same akua. Isn't Akua all one. <laughs> um, but everything that came with that particular tradition is what I question. Mm. Because that 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 whole thought, I don't always blame the message. I usually blame the messengers. Mm. Because it's how they perceive, how they see, and how they deliver the message that matters. Mm-hmm. And if they're not able to deliver it in a way that works for everybody and that is truthful and pono, then the whole message gets skewed. And I can see that kind of squeezing its way, what's well, been in the church since the founding of the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. you know, and even today. And so for, for all the Hawaiians out there on the spiritual path, if you're Christian or not, it's still a good read. Okay, yeah, my dad got it for us. He, that's my dad who asked the question. Oh, nice. He got it for us, uh, that book for us to, for Christmas. I haven't read it yet, but... Yeah, a pretty good read. Uh, um, yeah, I'm and gonna easy get to read. It. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah. I know it was like very short. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, no. Yeah. Next question comes from Mermaid Keala. Mm. This person wants to know, Heha ko manao make colonization o ho'oponopono. So translated, he wants to know, what is his thoughts on the colonization she, she. of... What is that? She. Oh, she, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I saw a guy on the, the profile oh, picture. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know who this is? Yeah, she come from Big Island. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, it's yeah. a couple picture. Yeah, couple, couple, couple. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, my bad. Uh, she wants to know... What is your your thoughts yeah, on the colonization of Ho'oponopono, though? And I guess you have to explain what Ho'oponopono okay. is. Um, <laughs> Ho'oponopono, for all of our listeners out there that haven't heard of what Ho'oponopono is, Ho'oponopono is a Hawaiian approach to healing relationships and reconciliation, um, is what I've learned. Um, and in Ho'oponopono, so, so when you say Ho'opono, Ho'o is an action uh, kind of precursor word 
to the word that it comes before. Mm-hmm. So if if you have pono, which means righteous, which means alignment, being in balance, um, to kind of being in a state of truth, you can say ho'opono is to bring that into action. So ho'opono is, could say to reinstate, uh, to rebalance the the individual self, ho'opono. But when you go to ho'opono pono, it means to bring the pono um, in, in interrelationship. And so uh, through relationships, you implement practices that help you to rekindle um to heal, to reconcile, to forgive, and then to move past. Mm-hmm. And so in the ancient times in Hawaii, all of our ohanas, every kayaulu, every ohana had a ho'oponopono person, had a healer that was in their um, space, in their ahupua'a, that if there was big conflict between families or a person in the family with his family and it was getting to a point where it was too destructive for the family unit that a ho'oponopono um, a kahu or a kahuna would come in and he would facilitate a ho'oponopono to just make amends Mm -hmm. and to heal and to move past and he would do that I've learned that there's you know that, that there was so much different schools for this as there's as much different schools for hula that your approach to ho'oponopono could look different than your cousin that leave one ahupua mm-hmm. down. Yeah, mm-hmm. but and and it could change depending on the situation. It's going to be based on what's happening um, on the approach you take. And so she's asking, how do you feel about the colonization of ho'oponopono? Yeah. Um, uh, Ho'oponopono hit the mainstream because uh, a, a good uncle who is, who is a Hulin, um, his first name doesn't come to mind right now, Ekala um, Kahu. I think he passed away already. Um, but but he, he got interviewed by a personal development guru. And this personal development guru, um, his... His last name is Vitale, and his first name is Joe. So he was on The Secret. He teaches a lot about the law of attraction. Um, I like a lot of his teachings, yeah. But but this is where I, I feel that he stepped a little bit over. Um, but that was also up to the kahu, because I'm not too sure if the kahu actually put into place his parameters of, of, of what to do with that information. Because what happened is, as a lot of these person development gurus do um, and teachers do, is they create courses for it or they write a book on it depending on interviews. And the storyline is so beautiful, which, which, which I give a lot of honor to, because the storyline is the kahu worked in prisons for over 30 years and how he healed his relationships with the inmates and how the inmates were a lot of gangs in the prisons in Hawaii, in Arizona. He was working in them to, to actually make uh, healing resolutions with all the gangs inside the prison and even with the, the inmates, with their families. So they would come and he would facilitate ho'oponopono and he was successful almost 100% of the time. And he told these actually stories to this person development guru. And what took place is that basically he capitalized on it. He created online courses, probably made over three, four, five million dollars on his courses, on his books um, that is based on Ho'oponopono. And then he started leading his retreats to teach other people that are interested in this about it. So now you see a lot of quote unquote hippies or people in the conscious community, in the new age community, really doing a lot of the practices um, of what they say is Ho'oponopono because how he taught it was simplistic, which ultimately is what Ho'oponopono is. And this 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 isn't a validation to do it, but if you can break down the steps of reconciliation and forgiveness into four steps, it would be, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you, thank you. Mm-hmm. Which is what we see in those viral videos. That's what the, we see in the, the viral women. videos. Uh, uh, please, uh, please, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and which which is is fine, but they don't have to call it Ho'oponopono mm-hmm. because what it does is it then begins to invade the the uniqueness and the kapu around Ho'oponopono. Yeah, and, and so what I think about the colonization of Ho'oponopono is that um, if you haven't learned how to do Ho'oponopono through a kumu, a practitioner, then I wouldn't fully say that it's Ho'oponopono. And for all, for all of the kanaka who practice Ho'oponopono, please know this, that, that, that I don't always believe that you have to learn through a kupuna, through a kumu to learn Ho'oponopono because Ho'oponopono lives in us as kanaka. And when you practice healing, reconciliation, and forgiveness um, in a way that is effective for you and that works, and you just are a person that does healing. Like me, I do a lot of healing. I, I don't call it Ho'oponopono. But it could be called reconciliation and and, uh, just being in a state of forgiveness. But once you integrate Ho'oponopono as our Hawaiian language, um, as a label on what you're doing and then commercializing off of it is when there gets a little bit sticky. So for people out there to protect yourself, I would not say to use Ho'oponopono as a word of what you do. You can still do it. It's still doing the great work of reconciling people's relationships mm-hmm. with Aina, with, with their families. But to call it Ho'oponopono almost invites heavy condemnation and ridicule f- th- 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 uh, through the Hawaiian community because you're then utilizing our words and our practices of what is, and we don't really agree that that's what you're fully doing. Yeah. yeah. And so to heal that, we need more kanaka, that are practicing ho'oponopono, that can teach people in a way that is kapu, that is pono, and that can empower people to do that healing work in their communities. Mm -hmm. So to empower our people to get into that position, because as you see with everything, if we don't get into the cultural authority position, then it seems that other people just jump in and they exploit it without knowing, but because they can see an opportunity, you know? Yeah. And it's just the same thing they did with the word aloha or Mm. the brand of Hawaii. Same. Just exploiting it. Aye. Yeah. That, it keeps happening, but yeah, it's, it's up to us. It's our kuleana to tell people, educate people that it's not pono. Yes. Uh, even though it's whole pono pono, you aye, know, aye. it's just it's it's all about your intention. I agree. With mm-hmm. What you're doing, so I cringe all the time. But I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, there's no sense of putting energy into hating on these people yes. where we can put energy into educating them. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that is a place where us as Kanaka can get into a power position mm-hmm. that 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 is pono. Mm-hmm. Because these people who are doing this, they don't mean bad. Yeah, and I try to do the best that I can um, to be objective and to not judge. Yeah. Because, you know, our Hawaiian community has a tendency to judge a lot. You know, sure. all people, right? And so to put that into practice, detaching um, all of those things that may come up in you once you see a person that is not Hawaiian doing Hawaiian things mm-hmm. and, and to have curiosity and to come and ask, yeah. you know, we are very intimidating people to a lot of people. And we're also at the same time, very, very welcoming and inviting. So try to mesh those two. Be welcoming and inviting, but strong in, in your aloha. And when you're engaging with a person that you feel uh, may not be doing something right, to not come right off the bat with just condemnation and judgment Mm -hmm. come with with a heart that is open but with an authority of your kupuna that when they see you they just know and they will honor you i problem it it's worked almost 100 percent of the time for me Mm -hmm. because i see these people as being people that are doing good for the world and they just need guidance Mm -hmm. especially when they're in hawaii yeah and then the people outside maybe they just really love something about hawaii so they just try to you know Open up a shop. For example, I was in Canada earlier um, oh. this year. Where? Uh, in uh, Whistler, doing a snowboarding trip. Nice. And then we stopped by in Vancouver, passing by. So we spent a day there. And we're walking around, my girlfriend and I. And we're just trying to find somewhere to eat. I just wanted to walk around. I didn't want to go on Yelp or anything. I just wanted to let it come to me, you know? Oh. And then we're walking by, and we turn the corner, and we see, like, the best poke or the Hawaiian kitchen or whatever it was called. And we're like, what? No way. There's a Hawaiian in Canada. Yeah. So stoked. There, there's uh, pictures on the wall, like some, I don't know, loco moco, teriyaki chicken plate, whatever, local kind of food. Aye. 
go inside. I'm so stoked. They were like, this is the place. Go inside. None of the workers look Hawaiian. We're like, okay, we'll just look at the menu. Talk to them. Oh, wow, that's, this is so cool. Like, um, where's the owner? Is the owner from Hawaii? Oh, no, he's from... I, I don't even know. I, I don't even think America. <laughs> it might have just been a, a different country to him. Oh, okay. Does he live in Hawaii? Oh, no. Uh, and I was like, what? Uh, uh. So I kind of looked at the menu for a little bit. And then I, I told my girlfriend, uh, we can probably just get better food somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But like, just because they weren't Hawaiian or not even, I don't know, nothing... Related to Hawaii from them besides the food, besides they were just trying to mimic our food. It's just the marketing. It's just the marketing, but like that got me. And as, and it only stopped me from buying stuff because I'm from of Hawaii course. and I knew that this. Yeah, but look at all the people who all potentially the people, never been to Hawaii. And then they're going to think that's Hawaiian Has food. a dreamscape for it yeah. and they go right for it. And yeah. then the guy who's running this place is from Georgia or something, yeah, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. that stuff I don't really like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard not to judge them. Mm-hmm. Like you say, we shouldn't judge. But as soon as I got in there and I found you out that knew, nothing yeah. is related to Hawaii but the food. I uh, I know, bro. I didn't I didn't like that, so I left. I know, bro. I know, bro. Yeah. But anyways, uh, on to the next question Aye. because it's about food, actually. <laughs> well, that's a perfect segue. Karen Gine... Wants to know what's his favorite food. What's my favorite food? Hawaiian. What's my favorite food? You know, I was vegan for a long time. Oh wow! Um, after I got out of bodybuilding and I was going on the spiritual path, that just seemed the most closest to what I was attracting and manifesting into my life. And only eight months ago, in our postpartum journey, I started eating a little bit of fish again and meat again. Um, because that was what was available for that first two months for actually me and my girl um, and for her healing, which I got to give a shout out to my amazing wahine. Yes, Um, please do. I I love you, baby. Um, She's been involved in women's work for a long time. She's doing such an amazing job. What's um, your name? As as actually being a mother. Her first name is Hesmin, also known as Jasmine Mm -hmm. uh, Young Diaz. Uh, She actually came from Orlando. Mm. Um, and been in Hawaii. She got inspired by the Mauna to come to Hawaii. Oh, right and she was involved in like a lot of advocacy work and aloha aina kind of things and just learning. And that's how we mm. kind of yeah. had crossed paths. Yeah. Um, but in terms of food, you know, my favorite food um, is whatever I'm eating in that present moment. Mm. Um, I try my best to be present. I don't really have too much favorites of what I crave. Um, Anything that is to em- to empower, to nourish, and to elevate th- all the mana uh, that I have that, that that I need in that current moment. Um, but if I had to choose one, so so if I had to choose one, uh, I love poi. Mm-hmm. Um, I love poi. I I try to eat poi almost every day. Um, but in, in terms of like a thing that I can also have every day is high quality acai. Oof, I, um, I eat some high quality acai almost every day um, from this amazing acai shop. They got three locations. Their name is the Tropical Tribe. They have one, they have two in Waikiki and one in Haleiwa. Um, mm. And I'm actually going to be doing a kava bar over there oh, right um, in this next month. I got to check them out. Oh, it's because highest quality as- of, of all acai. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the most pure form of acai. His connections to the people in his family that have a farm there. He owns a processing center there and mm-hmm. he ships all of his own acai. From Brazil? And, and it's out of Brazil. Oof. And he's Brazilian. So so it's the dark kind with, with the skin, oh, right? dark. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. difference with, yeah. that they leave the skin on, right? No, no. Or, well, 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 they um, usually a lot of the um, other spots of acai is they have a blend. Mm. So potentially they have maybe 50% acai and then, you know, they add fruits and bananas inside mm-hmm. to kind of expand it. So it's not pure acai, mm-hmm. but, but because the potency of the berry itself is so strong, it still tastes like acai. Um, his acai is 93, 94% acai. He adds a little bit of banana um, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and his acai is rich, it's dark. And I've been an, kind of like an acai connoisseur since I was <laughs> young. Um, and I would usually only eat at particular places that had good acai. Once I eat his, I don't eat acai anywhere else wow. though. Yeah. 
Cool. I got to check it out. Yeah, bro. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, right before we get into the last question, can you just tell us about your um, bodybuilding history? Oh, dang. That was, that was interesting when I looked, looked you up. Yeah, I, yeah. It yeah. makes sense because you're pretty built. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, um, so I got into training and this is like a good segment to have. Mm-hmm. Mahalo kia kua, you know, <laughs> I love talking about bodybuilding, yeah, bro. Yeah. bro it, it, um, it, it played an intricate part of who I am. Um, and so because I've always played sports, I was always dependent on the players on my team to succeed, right? Uh, to, to kind of be on a good team. So you always played team sports? Always played team sports. Mm-hmm. Um, up until high school, the first individual sport that I played was probably track. Okay. And I started seeing that I was doing great in track because um, it was all on me. And the effort that I was going to put in is is actually going to produce the, the results that I want. So I was pretty scrawny all of my life. Um, eighth grade, I was maybe, I, in my freshman year, I started my, I, I ended my freshman year at 110 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, still pretty shredded, still pretty strong, but um, always had big hands, big feet, but I was always kind of scrawny. Um, but, you know, always expressive and all that kind of stuff, but I couldn't hold my, my own um, in different ways. Like if it was me and my brother um, at home wrestling, he would always overpower me. Like he, he knew how to, or he was just more strong. Mm-hmm. And so I was interested in getting stronger, but I have, I have, I have a little bit of a, an extreme personality of going all in on things that I love and I believe in. And in my freshman year, I, I started training pretty consistently. Um, I spoke to my dad. He brought in a weight set at our house, uh, training every night. I was training every day at school. I, I was obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was going all in and in, all in. And I was seeing results. And as I was seeing results, I was also seeing how people's respect levels mm. was also increasing for me. The same guys who was bullying you was kind of, hey, yeah, hey, 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 what's up, bro? Friend? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, bro. I mean, hey, you know, high school, mm-hmm. you know, stuff happens like that. And and I was getting a little bit picked on here and there, you know, just, but I, I, I always had aloha. Always had mana, and I was always game. Mm-hmm. If anybody wanted for act up, I was always game. Yeah, um, but I didn't want any of that to be a hindrance to who I was. Mm-hmm. And so I, I seen it as a great way of personal development, of growing and seeing what I could do, how much I could push. Yeah, and so I started going, bro. And then in my freshman year, uh, the ending of my freshman year, there was a senior at that time who was one of the biggest men on campus, and and he's still a good brother of mine. His name is Marcus Kimura, um, and he's a coach of St. Louis right now. Um, and he was a bodybuilder, bro. And he was a bodybuilder, and he was so big. As a senior in high school, he looked like a man. And and his muscle bellies were so phenomenal that I walked up to him one day. I was like, hey, bro, um, I'm a freshman now, 13. <laughs> I go, bro, I'm not too sure if you can or anything, but what? what? If can train me, because I shall forget big. And, and you know, he was, he was kind of taken back. Plenty of guys asked him before, but he, he told me that there was something about me mm-hmm. that he was willing to invest in. And so I went on that journey with him, bro. And it was him who introduced me first to my first disciple <laughs> at Health Bar. <laughs> um, and, and, bro, and, bro, he sponsored me. He poured into me. He brought me protein shakes. He brought me all of my supplements. Wow. And he was a senior and had big money. I don't know how, but <laughs> he was paying for me, bro, doing stuff, bro. And I was... I was getting results and I was training. In that break, the ending of my freshman year to the beginning of 10th grade, I went from 110 to 155 oh. um, in three months. So some good protein. Bro, I came back, dude. I came back to school. Everybody was tripping out. They're, ho, oh, kala, ho. Oh. He went into Mr. Crusader this year. Because if you guys don't know, at St. Louis, there is a competition mm-hmm. every year. It's I called the Mr. Crusader. It's been a bodybuilding competition that has been in place ever since, I think, the 80s. Um, and whoever wins Mr. Crusader is the big dog on campus. Mm. Yeah, like he's Mr. Crusader. And and everybody begins to hear, all the girls' schools oh, wow. hear that this is Mr. Crusader. So even um, bigger than like Homecoming King or Prom 100%. King? 100%. Oh, my Bro, Mr. Crusader was was everything, though. Okay. And, and so each year at the Aloha Fest at St. Louis, May, the ending of the year, 
we had the Aloha Fest, which was a carnival thing, like a Punahou carnival. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then th- th- there was a dance. But before the dance, there was Miss Crusader. Um, and it was two hours long, and there was like 600 people, six to 800 people who came out. A, a, a majority of them high schoolers from all around. They just want to come watch Miss Crusader. So that year, I was in the 10th grade. I was seeing a, amazing progress, and I was going to make a decision. I didn't want to enter Miss Crusader in the beginning of the year, but I was making some great progress. I decide, dog, in April, I'm entering Miss Crusader. I'm the only 10th grader entering, and there's 11 seniors. <laughs> yeah, and I'm entering, bro. Dog, I win. So what, what, was the, <laughs> what was the competition like? <laughs> oh, there was top notch, you know. Um, it's, you know, in aspects of bodybuilding, it's based on development, muscularity, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the body, the symmetry, the balance, all of that is involved in bodybuilding. So it was an actual bodybuilding competition. So you had, you had to lift weights too, was it? Oh, like to train. No, no, no. no, so, no, no. So, so it was uh, like the kind you flex and... So, yes. Yeah, so there's power lifting. Okay. So it has power lifting, um, which is... Heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so bent squat deadlift is powerlifting. Uh, in the sport of bodybuilding, it's based on physique. Okay. So, so, so kind of like... Pageants. Of, of, of all time, the biggest bodybuilder that is the most internationally known is Arnold, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, he was the biggest inspiration for mm-hmm. me at that time. So I entered Mr. Crusader, and to keep a long story short, I win that year. Um, it was a beautiful thing that really put my confidence on the oh, map in the sure. 10th grade. I was the president of my class that year. Um, I was doing awesome things in GROTC. Uh, I was an honor society doing plenty high excelling stuff. Mm-hmm. And to win Mr. Crusader was like the cream of the crop yeah. thing. Uh, because at that point, there were only like 18 people that won Miss Crusader. Yeah, and so I won Miss Crusader, um, engine my back going into my junior year, healed up enough, came back. I had a two-peat and won again. I came back my senior year, three-peat. I was the first guy to win Mr. Wow. Um, to actually win Mr. Crusader three times. To this day? To this day. Um, and I put that in your bio. <laughs> <laughs> and then had an invitation to enter into the state Mr. High School competition that, that had competitors from, mm-hmm. from um, all across the Hawaiian Islands. I won that in my senior year. Come on, guys. You thought you was going to beat Mr. Crusader. <laughs> Come on. Come on, Punahoi Iolani. Bro, bro. Bro, I was a senior in bodybuilding, and I already had sponsorships. So, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I had sponsorships for clothing, for all of my supplements. And then people started getting a hang of stuff. And then I win the state Mr. High School. You know, then... I have a chance to get featured on the front of the sports page um, in the Honolulu Advertiser. And then from at that point, I actually enter into the Junior Stingray, which is an actual bodybuilding competition that 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 is like an MPC qualifier. I enter the teen. I win that one. I enter to the Paradise Cup, which is the biggest bodybuilding competition that year again when I was only 18. I just made 18. Um, and I almost won by three points. I got second. Hmm. Um, and then I took a break. And kind of at that time, which, which you know, is a controversial thing for a lot of people speaking about, um, you know, uh, PEDs and anabolic steroids and its part that it plays in different sports and professional sports. And in bodybuilding, you cannot really get to the next level if you aren't on, as we call it, if you're not on gear. And I, I speak about this opening now because it's becoming just like a wide range, you know, um, exchange of conversation now between all people. And I was 18 years old and I had to make the decision mm-hmm. if I wanted to get to the next level. And if I was willing to do whatever it took to get to the next level. Um, I had offers to go to college, uh, to play ball. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay home and I wanted to bodybuild and, and actually become the first Hawaiian pro bodybuilder who was of Hawaiian descent because I could use that platform to inspire the next generation. Mm-hmm. That was my, my aim and intention the whole time. I made that decision at 18 years old. You know what? I want to get to the next level. I'm willing to go there. Let's do it. Um, I spent uh, 11 weeks on a cycle, on my first cycle. Um, and I went from 185 pounds to 235 pounds <laughs> in, in, in 11 weeks, bro. Oh. Yeah. I, I was 18 years old um, and... Just straight jack. Inclined benching the 405. I could squat 450. Oh. 
I could pull 500. You no know, I was way. super strong. And I developed that for 18 months. And then I prepared to go into the Paradise Cup two years later. And I, I, I entered the Paradise Cup now in open division, which is more of like the high tier uh, kind of class division, uh, the open and the novice. I entered into the open. I was 19. And these are all still on YouTube. And you're in college? I, I was at HCC. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, not like a university team? No, no, or, no. Okay. Um, but all of my focus was on bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. I didn't care about anything. I was in a relationship mm-hmm. and bodybuilding were my two cornerstones. Mm-hmm. And I was pushing in bodybuilding. I was making stuff happen, getting content out. Oh, bro. Just, just making it happen because yeah. Paradise Cup comes. Everybody's anticipating, bro. Everybody's anticipating. How does Kala look? How does Kala look? Hawaiian, I come on the scene. Kanaka, freaking open. And... Everybody was pretty blown away that yeah, a teenager is in the open and he has the potential to actually win the overall this 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 year. That was my whole goal to turn pro to become an IFBB professional. Um, and then I took a break. I had another off season. Um, I came back. I entered it again. It was good. I almost got the overall that one, um, and I was only twenty. And then I took a huge off season. Hired the best coach. That was, that was doing all the professionals entering Mr. Olympia. And I went from 205 pounds um, to 255 was my heaviest. I was 255. How much do you weigh now just to for one, I'm I'm one I'm about 180 right now. Okay. Yeah. But in shape, I feel good. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty optimal and I can breathe. I couldn't really breathe bro, mm. when I was 255. You probably had no neck. That's why. I was a tank though. <laughs> Strong. Big bro. Like your um, son right now. But Hawaiian. <laughs> I would be in front of my dad, but you know, my, my, he a big guy about my dad, right? 265. He was 265 at that time. I would be in front of my dad and you couldn't really see him in the back of me. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was big, bro. And, and, but things in my life started getting kind of chaotic, out of balance. My hormone systems were off. Um, I was in a different place in my life. I didn't feel good. I was going through a spiritual awakening mm-hmm. and I decided... Um, I needed answers. I couldn't break out of it. Because when you get into bodybuilding and athletes um, and, you know, all different athletes, there is a thought process and paradigm that 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 actually forms an identity around that sport. That's why you see a lot of athletes mm-hmm. come out of sports and they go into depression because yep. they don't know who they are. I was in that, that uh, stage and phase of my life um, and I needed answers. And brother, I... I st- I was listening to Joe Rogan in the beginning of his podcasting. I was listening to Joe Rogan, and he, he was talking about, ah, I just couldn't say him. He, he was talking about DMT Hawaiian mm-hmm. and um, his experiences on ayahuasca and plant medicine. Hawaiian, I got some DMT. I needed some help, bro. I needed some help. I was praying, but I needed answers. Kanaka, I did some DMT, and I got the answer immediately. I needed to step back from bodybuilding and just go through that process of cleansing myself wow. and, and just just to release that. So from 255 in one year, I came all the way back down to about 200 pounds, you know, and I stopped it and I had to go to this whole shift of how do I relate to the world now? Because everybody that I know, they know me as Kala, the bodybuilder. Um, And, and, you know, people in the gym, they go, oh, bro, you're getting small, huh? Oh, the kind of eagle shots. uh, Mm -hmm. Everybody always taking eagle shots. uh, And, but I came out of that, but I learned so much, met so much amazing people. And to this day, I still consider myself a bodybuilder because Mm -hmm. um, it's a thing that you are for life and you do for life. And I wouldn't be able to be who I am today if it wasn't for bodybuilding, what I learned in bodybuilding and the tools that I apply today that was really birthed in bodybuilding. Yeah. Same way I look at sport is all the lessons I've learned from just that, even though you know, I was in a professional or a collegiate athlete. Yes. I had a, a collegiate major, communications. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, you know, the lessons that I learned just from that, you yes. know, I, I I hold on to that throughout my life. Yes. That's an amazing story. I had no idea. Yeah, Bakila. That, that's, I know, That bro. is crazy. But, uh, oh, okay. What, what is that? So this is my ho'okupu to you, Hawaii, to end this episode. Um, this is pure mana. Okay. So pure mana is a tincture that I created and formulated uh, through prayer as well. It came through me. This has three main ingredients. There is one has kava or ava um, in Hawaii. Um, there is olena or Hawaiian turmeric. Mm-hmm. And there is Himalayan shilajit. Himalayan shilajit is actually... Um, 
it's a resin that is only found in the high altitudes of the Himalayan mountains. And so Himalayan shilajit um, is pure minerals. And it's told, it's been proven through, uh, through actually research that it, it increases your hormone production and testosterone. It actually gives you higher quality of clean energy. And um, it gives the minerals that you need to all of your atoms and cells in your body. Um, and it's also considered to be in Russia, the conqueror of weakness. Wow. And so it makes you stronger. It makes you faster. It makes you think better. Um, and it makes you clearer. And so all of these put together, I call it pure mana. It's like Joe Rogan's version of Athletic Greens. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so, so um, but... I have this other product that is actually called the Greens of Greatness, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the Greens of Greatness is our Greens product. So this is our pure, uh, this is our pure mana in Awakened Aloha, which in this part of our Awakened Aloha is actually called the Mana Medicinals. And we're going to be launching this on TikTok um, in this next, uh, I've, I've had this product for over two years already, but I haven't had an official launch. Wow. So I'm going to be launching this on TikTok um, in the next uh, two to three weeks. And... I wanted to extend to you a whole kupu of the pure man. Mahalo so much. Mahalo I'm excited to, do, to to start taking this and yes. get to 250 pounds. <laughs> Guaranteed, right? That's what you said, right? <laughs> Buy my money back. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, okay, we're, we're not ending yet. We, we're not going to let you go yet because I have still so many questions for you. And you keep making me more curious, like the DMT stuff and all of that. Yeah, yeah, um, bro. We can let, keep let, going if you like, Hawaii. Yes, let's, let's fin finish this last question of the Instagram um, portion, Kay. and then we'll get into some other stuff. MKSD47 wants to know, this is a question that everybody loves, what does it mean to be Hawaiian? What does it mean to be Hawaiian? I'm going to have that perspective in, in a couple ways. Um, one, to be a person of Hawaii, uh, is one is to consider yourself to become an aina of this land and to embody and to live all the principles, all the values of what is inherently Hawaii through the people of Hawaii, so through the Kanaka Maoli. So a person of Hawaii, I believe, who uh, is Kama Aina, you can be of any heritage if you choose to live in the way of Aloha and in the way of Hawaii. Uh, to be Hawaiian is different. Because literal in its terminology, to be Hawaiian, um, is considering who you are to actually be a Hawaiian national. So in the term itself, because the Hawaiian word, Hawaiian is not a Hawaiian word. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian is a uh, hua olelo haule. Um, it, it isn't a Hawaiian word at all. It's not in um, our Hawaiian language dictionary. But Hawaiian was birthed to identify people that would become a subject of the Hawaiian kingdom. Meaning, if you are Portuguese as an immigrant to the Hawaiian kingdom, if you are German, if you are English, if you're Chinese, if you're Filipino, if you're Japanese coming to Hawaii because of all of the relationships we had, you would actually then become um, one, a dual citizen, or a ha Hawaiian national, Hawaiian subject. So being a person that has the koko, being Kanaka Oivio Hawaii Ne, who has the koko, that's much different than being Hawaiian if you're taking it literally. Mm -hmm. But if you want to use it like figuratively and what it could mean to be Hawaiian in spirit, Hawaiian at heart, that also means that you are a person that embodies the way of our people and have been inspired by Hawaii and are implementing these principles in your life while you are in relationship to also Hawaii as a steward of our land, our people, our culture. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to take that one word, Hawaiian national, if you're going to take a person that is Hawaiian at at heart or in spirit, which is a controversial term that, that like a lot of Kanaka, they don't like me using, that uh, that like a person can be Hawaiian at heart because it gives people permission to exploit our, our, our people, our words, um, and who we are. Um, but we have all met a person that did not have koko, mm -hmm. that had aloha, yeah. that had been a person of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have all met them. And to say that you haven't, that they weren't Hawaiian enough yeah, and a person of Hawaii where, where, where they had their children here um, and their parents came from here and they have been a part of the people of Hawaii. They 
Ola al Hawaii, they dance hula, they're good people. I would say that those people are the special people that that could be reserved for, that they yeah. are Hawaiian at heart, you yeah. know, or they, they, they could be an honorary Hawaiian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an yeah. honorary Hawaiian. I guess Hawaiian. That's, that's the PC term, right? The yeah, politically correct yeah, way to say yeah, it. Yeah, honorary, honorary Hawaiian. Because there are so many people there who are have so done many so people much for the Lahui I that am. aren't Koko Hawaii. That aren't Koko Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, so it's hard for us to be like, you're not Hawaiian because of this. So it's practicing your discernment yeah. on what that looks like and you choosing to actually bear the responsibility that if you actually give a person that, that they're Hawaiian at heart, that you open yourself up for ridicule mm-hmm. from Kanaka. And you're going to have to bear that responsibility on, in essence, defending how come you choose to see it that way? Because yeah. Makavalu, there's you know, there's all different eyes and perspectives to different things, um, but everything needs to be appropriate and pono. Yeah, the one the one thing I sometimes think about that I never thought about before, but having these conversations just you know makes my mind goes to go to all these different places. What's gonna happen in thousand, two thousand, three thousand, ten thousand years when Koko Hawaii is pa- gone? Is gone. Mm-hmm. I mean that's that's the reality. There's, there's it's so few of us. Aye. I'm less than fifteen percent. Mm-hmm. A couple of more generations. Mm-hmm. My my great 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 whatever grandkids, they probably won't even. They'll have point zero one percent of Hawaiian. I don't Aye. know. Then what happens? Does it all matter? I you see you see you know that's <laughs> that's like a part of the reason why um, in like speaking about the perpetuation and conservation of our people. We are not only speaking about the, the conservation of our koko, but also speaking about the consciousness, the no'o no'o of our kupuna. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I heard a presentation. Uh, this was a presentation actually on behalf of Kamehameha Schools. The, the actually presenter was Kalihua Krug. Uh, I love Uncle Kalihua. He's a good mana. He's one of our great leaders um, in our generation of Hawaii. And he, he was giving a quote. Um, in his presentation of one of our kupuna that that had basically had been saying that in the future, our kupuna in the Hawaiian kingdom, they predicted that in our current time that there was going to be kanaka that looked like you and me, that is not super, super dark and are mixed. And the only way that we are able to pinpoint and identify uh, who is who is of Hawaii and who is kanaka is through our olalo. Mm. And through our mana. Yeah, that's the only way. Yeah, and he was the head um, in the Hawaiian kingdom. He was the head um, of the Department of Education. Yeah, and, and so I say that that for all people that love Hawaii, if you love Hawaii, if you love things Hawaiian, the thing that, that you can do is study, is to grow, is to become a haumana of our people, is to learn and to know who you are um, through that process mm-hmm. and to not lose yourself in thinking that you're just Hawaiian mm-hmm. because I'm half Kanaka, but I'm also half European. And I ha- have a chance to to pull these pieces of who I am as a Portuguese Hawaiian, as a German Hawaiian, uh, as a Chinese Hawaiian and integrate that because all of my kupuna I tell people it, all, all of my kupuna men in the Hawaiian kingdom. Mm. All of That's them. That's awesome. All right. Sometimes we forget about our other ethnicities. Yeah, right? Hawaiian. You're only claiming Kanaka. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm an innovative <laughs> Hawaiian. Yeah, it's yeah. like, but I'm 15% Hawaiian, but like 50% Japanese, but I only identify as Hawaiian because it's the cool to do that in Hawaii. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> One of the things that we just got to keep talking about. I love about. it. I love it. All man. right. Mahalo, everybody, for the Instagram questions. Make sure you leave some for our next guest. And maybe a question will make it on the podcast. Okay. Just a couple more questions. And, yeah, let's do um, it. Let's do I, it. I really want to dive into this. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, do you have any insecurities as a Hawaiian? And how do you Ooh. overcome them? Because, for example, you don't have a Hawaiian last name. Aye. I don't have a Hawaiian last name. I was just talking to my, my brother about this because when he got married... Let's take a coffee break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo noi, mahalo noi. Yeah. Jordan, you got to get in on this. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any left. <laughs> <laughs> mahalo kia kua. Okay. Sorry, we're just taking a coffee break, everybody. Mahalo kia kua. Mahalo yeah. kia kua. Give all the blessings to your kupuna. And peace and love be with you, yep. my brethren. And my kanaka kahane. Yep. Yo. Mm. Mm. Oh, okay, mahalo. Yola. Ready, ready. Ready, ready. ready for the, to, to, to bring this home. Okay, so 
my brother, he thought about changing his last name to mm-hmm. his wife's last name, Kamahele, Aye. because we don't have a Hawaiian last name. We Aye. have Hawaiian ancestry, Aye. you know, on the big island from Molokai, wherever. But our last name is Diaz because that was when my dad was growing up, he didn't have a relationship with his dad, um, who is Sonora. So Sonora is actually all, all of our middle names, mm. but it should be our last name. Mm. But my dad was adopted by Diaz, mm. his stepfather, when my, my grandma married him. Mm. So we're Diaz. Mm. But to change Diaz to something else, it's going to be confusing because... It could uh, be. I mean, for me, yeah. I think about it every now and then, like... Do I want to change my last name? Because mm-hmm. having mm-hmm. a Hawaiian last name would be so cool. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. even though it's like, Agreed, I don't Kanaka. need it to make my life better. Mm. You know, I just, to me, it's like, I don't know, Kamaka, something, something aye, would, be, aye, aye, aye. would be pretty cool. And like, I, I identify as a Hawaiian mainly. Mm. I live the culture. I, aye. Aye. I would love to pass down a Hawaiian last of name course, to my 100%, kids. 100%, honey. Um, 100%. But, you know, I play sports all my life. DS is in the back of all my aye, uniforms. Aye, aye, aye. DS is in my social media. Aye. Kamaka DS. They go, hey, Española. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like Portuguese, actually. Oh, yeah? DS with an S. Z is the... Oh, yeah, the, yes, S, yeah, S. Yeah, yeah. But I am oh, Spanish Portuguese. and Portuguese, yeah. yeah. So, you know, sometimes I'm a little insecure about that because I want to... Every... Every time that I talk about these subjects about Hawaiian, I'm always like, oh, how can I be more Hawaiian? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. how can I do things that make me more Hawaiian? Mm-hmm. And it, it, honestly, it's an ego thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that I'm sure not, I'm not the only one that, oh, that absolutely, struggles bro. with You're not that. the only so, one at all. And I, I realized your last name is McShane. McShane, yeah. I wonder if you think the same or you have any other insecurities. Yeah, so, so you know, um, speaking of our last names, I was contemplating actually before we had our son um, to, to have a change of our last name. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not because I am against being a McShane. I'm proud being to actually be a McShane. I'm proud to be a McShane from Papakolea. Um, and it is the Inoa that our Makuakane gave us. Um, the place that I started to question was, where did McShane come from? Um, how come y- you don't know? Yeah, I would ask my aunties, I would ask my uncle guys, ask my grandma and my grams. They have no idea where they started having McShane in their line. And so being in my ohana, I'm the one kind of instating our culture genealogy back into our family in our generation. Um, and I started asking these hard questions because you're, you're exactly right. It's not that having a Hawaiian last name um, is quote unquote better than having another last name. But what it has to do with is identity. And, and how the mana of who you are can be associated to your name as your first label placed on you. And so as a Kanaka, I was doing all of my research in genealogy and on our tutu side, she come from Haleiwa, her ohana, um, her uh, inoa ohana is Mahaulu that had been an influential family um, in Wailua. And... I was interested in taking that step on on having a name change so that at this point, um, all of my ohana and mo'opuna after me is going to have this last name. But I was battling with it because I, if I was going to do that, I would have to have the blessing of my father. And I didn't feel he was always in that state to fully understand what I was meaning because he wasn't raised as a Hawaiian. His name is Alfred Burt McShane. Yeah, no Hawaiian name. All of my ohana, majority of my ohana, no, they have no Hawaiian names at, at all. That's a trip to me. Mm-hmm. I have a small Hawaiian name is Kala. And the reason why I had a small Hawaiian name was because the, the thought in my mom's mind was that it would be easy to put on paper. To keep it short. So your Hawaiian-ness is determined on your assimilation into the system. And I didn't agree on that, bro. Mm-hmm. I didn't agree on that. But I can't, you know, it's a, oh, akua, or my kupuna, they know me as kala. Okay, mm-hmm. kala. And kala is the sun, which means, wait, so my name is not really kala. It's, it's kanehoalani. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> I go like that. Mm. Huh? Yeah. Um, but but you know, I'm I'm still in that process of thinking, bro. I'm still in that process of thinking about that because I then have learned since that point of how we got the name McShane and how our kupuna who came from Australia then to Canada, then to Hawaii, um, he didn't even have, his last name wasn't even McShane. Mm. He took on that last name when, when he came to Hawaii. Mm. Yeah, so, so that name came out of nowhere, right? So never really have mana attached yeah. to it, right? And like a lot of the McShanes in our current day, especially in the 50s and 60s, were kind of infamous because we, we were kind of involved in some stuff in Chinatown. Oh, in that's your mafia side. Yeah, it is. <laughs> no, Hawaii, it is. Yeah, and, and, and so... Um, Insecurities as a Hawaiian, um, it's a constant process. It's a constant process. Um, I am in my, my own spiritual practice. I know who I am. So all of my insecurities that were pr uh, potentially prevalent in my um, upbringing has been equalized, has been neutralized. So insecurities as a person, no. Mm -hmm. Insecurities as a Hawaiian, Usually, brother, that comes up when I'm with Hawaiians mm -hmm. because there, there, there is a tendency with our kanaka, with our lahui um, to, as I stated earlier, to have a little bit of prejudice and to judge on based on a scale of how Hawaiian you are. And there's this almost uh, hierarchy that I think is one of the plagues and the byproducts of our Ali system, is there was this big divide about who you were according to what you know, um, which, which to some extent, depending on how you look at it, is valid. Um, but in terms of our humanity, you know, in terms of who we are as Kanaka, um, and what we are as people of Hawaii, I don't think it's always appropriate and doesn't always have place. And so for, for all Kanakas who have insecurities on being Hawaiian enough, Hawaiian, you have always been Hawaiian enough. If you weren't Hawaiian enough, then you would not be Kanaka. Um, and if you know who you come from, then that's the only determining factor about who you are and what you can stand on. Because as Kanaka, we're so heavily based on genealogy that when you know your genealogy, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. If you know your genealogy, that's the fundamental cornerstone to, to your relationship, to your identity. Yeah. Um, you know, and then how I ask people all the time in our coaching programs, answering the hardest questions that every human has to answer. Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? What can I do? Where am I going? Your identity your, your heritage, your purpose, your potential, and your vision and destiny. If you can answer those, then you can encapsulate who you are in this present moment, and that's going to evolve. So as a Hawaiian, I wouldn't say I have too much insecurities. I'm always on the process. What I need to work on to equalize that when it comes up is be more curious and being in a state of peace and gratitude. Mm -hmm. That our kumu, everybody loves to be thanked for who they are and for their work. I also do. I, I have people from all around, you know, come up to me on the street, you know, who thank me for actually what I do. Mm -hmm. And I give honor to that. So in those spaces where I feel like, you know, I got to just be haumana, ha'aha, ha um, and pono, and noho ilalo. Pa'akavaha. Yes. They're saying pa'akavaha. I got it all backwards, but aye, aye, basically aye, 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 my dad would always tell yeah, us that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just basically just shut up and listen and yes, just and do it. Just, just work, just work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is some advice for visitors coming to Hawaii? Mm. One, I because this is like a basic way to do this, and I feel that our visitors do not have as much pre-education as they need. Mm -hmm. uh, pre-education meaning that when you're planning your trip, you are learning about things Hawaii. You are learning about things Kanaka. You are learning about our current events, our things that are issues that, that are facing the Hawaiian community and how to experience Hawaii authentically and rooted into what is Hawaii in comparison to what is the image that these agencies give you to convince you what is Hawaii. Because they pimp out paradise. They have always been doing that. You know, um, 
for all people out there who need a good book on this, Houlihan's Holland K. Trask, kind of a heavy read, powerful read, um, speaking about the expectation of Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian woman to, to build the whole tourism industry in Hawaii. And when you look at that, I can say that the first thing a person needs to do and have is to watch all my videos. Nah, nah, yeah. nah, nah. <laughs> actually, though, actually, no. Yeah, it's joking, to go not through joking. it. They're very good. Yeah, I really yeah. enjoy oh, them. Hey, man, mahalo yeah. I was watching some before this. Yeah, bro, is to go through it, is to explore, um, and is to take action. One of the ways that you can take action is you can go to our website and grab our etiquette guide, which is, which is at awakenaloha.org slash guide. This etiquette guide is going to give you basic tools and etiquette mm -hmm. um, and, and education on the etiquette of the Hawaiian Islands through Hawaiian culture values. So important to know as a starting point. Um, two, we're going to be introducing pre-educational courses. Um, it's so needed because it seems like a long stretch of what people need to learn. Right, which I also say opens up such great opportunity for Kanaka right now because the tourism industry, unfortunately, is not going to go anywhere. In the next 50 years, hopefully our dependency on it will, will actually minimize. But right now, uh, we, we have three legs and one of those main legs is tourism. Uh, economically. And so this opens up great opportunities for Kanakas, for our Kanaka creators to begin to get innovative on how to bring more education, mm -hmm. more experiences, more in-depth um, uh, immersion that people are looking for. Because our generation are not looking to go on tour buses anymore. They're not looking, you know, to, to uh, head out to all the main things that is a part of the city life um, in wherever we travel. We're more so looking for the authentic experiences, things that is rooted, things that is pono, because we've learned that how our parents and their parents have traveled is like outdated. You know, it's not really fully inclusive. And we've learned that it's more so destructive to the communities that that ultimately we are supposed to be serving mm -hmm. if we're visiting places. So us as Hawaiians need to get into that space, bro, um, and, and to capitalize on it because as Brother Kuike told me, all the Christians out there preach to us that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. The only way to Hawaii is through Kanaka. Mm. Yeah. So if people want to learn how to live Hawaii, how to experience Hawaii and learn from our people, you have to go to Kanaka. But our Kanaka have been a little bit passive on our business front, on getting out there into tourism and making a stakeholder, planting our flag, that we're going to control the narrative, we're going to control the voice, and we're going to control all the storytelling, everything, so that when people think of Hawaii, they don't think, and I'm not saying anything for all of my Asian brothers and sisters, they do not think of an Asian face. They think of a Hawaiian face. They think of our artists and practitioners. They think of our voices, our music, because you're in Hawaii it's only appropriate to do so. Mm -hmm. But the conditioning has been so long that people only associate what it looks to be Hawaiian like to people that also look Asian. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm Chinese too, so it's not that. But our population is so big, almost 50% Asian in Hawaii, right? That a lot of our tourism industry is geared to that population. Mm -hmm. So a lot of all the materials that, that is going out is also geared to the population. So if you want to be um, authentic, you want to be appropriate, you, you want to be pono when you're coming to Hawaii, you need to look at Hawaiian creators, Hawaiian businesses, and how can you integrate with them? How can you have a private excursion with a Hawaiian that comes from that district, from that island, and you can actually give your money to them? Yeah, so he can take you around. He can show you around. You and your wahine, you and your ohana. And you can begin to position Hawaiians in a way that we not are only uh, economically empowered, but our culture then becomes an economic superpower in Hawaii mm. that we're in charge of. Hey, oh. Yeah, you Hawaiian. I love yeah, it. Yeah, you Hawaiian. I love the passion too. That's awesome. Okay. I think I just got to invite you back next year for another talk story. Kiki and all. Because this, this is some, some great info right now. Before I ask you the final questions, I just want to know, what do you hope to accomplish in the next couple of years? What are um, your goals? Okay. Um, in the next few years, the um, intentions of ours right now for our three to five year plan, uh, one, we are in the process um, and are calling in all the abundance and corporate partnerships to to 
to really become almost like a face of Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So as an ambassador of Aloha and through the communication that I've been able to put out, I've seen that it resonates with 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 people around. Um, and so if people are coming to Hawaii, I want people to know that there is a place to get Hawaiian education, um, Hawaiian resources, Hawaiian practitioners through our work at Awaken Aloha. We are introducing... Um, a YouTube series soon actually called Aloha from Hawaii that, that is going to be all of our tourism and visitor content that uh, we're going to go on the streets of Waikiki. Uh, we're going to interview businesses. Oh, I love that. I want to get that established right now, um, and that's in the process. On our Awaken Aloha side, our spirit, culture, and consciousness side, we this the ending of this year, I am looking to introduce um, a book. And the book is going to be called The Way of Aloha, and it's going to be based on the spiritual philosophy of Hawaii that is applicable to today. And that is based on our three principles that I explained earlier about Aloha Aina, Aloha Akua, Aloha Kanaka. So getting that out and building our container and infrastructure on that to bring abundance. Um, And what that's going to lead to is us getting Aina. Um, Our aim is to get an Aina uh, that acts as a pu'uhonua. we have the whole plan for this. It's going to be called the blank. I'm not going to say it because it's <laughs> too beautiful. Um, and it's going to be an international hub of, of actually culture and spiritual practice for all people. Because I believe what is missing in our Lahui right now is different alternatives to practice spirituality. Mm. So therefore, we only go to what we know, and that's the church. And if people, if Kanaka had a place to go to that... that that they know is rooted in what is Pono and, and is what of is of our Akua, but is not so heavily adept with maybe things that that um, is kapu um, in the kapu system. It can be a place for all people to also come together and to heal and to be a beacon of world peace in Hawaii. Because Antipila Hipaki said that the world will come to Hawaii in its search for world peace because Hawaii has the key and that key is aloha. Mm -hmm. But there's not many places that people can experience the aloha in a spiritual setting that that actually helps to become a heartbeat for our communities. And that hopefully is able, not not hopefully, this is going to happen, can lead to our long-term vision in the next eight to 10 years of expanding on our Pu'uhonua project. Mm -hmm. And the Pu'uhonua project is going to be an initiative that we're going to get funded. Yeah, the Council Native Hawaiian advancement, a office of Hawaiian affairs, we got to get behind this. And this is to establish a pu'uhonua place within every ahupua'a. Um, and how, we'll, how we will begin that is through every district. That th- 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 there's going to be a house, maybe a half an acre, quarter of an acre, to house youth who, who are at risk, who are um, on drugs, a place for healing, but also a community development center for our communities to come to if they need help and support. Because you know, a lot of people do not know the highest population of human trafficking is Hawaiian women, is young Hawaiian girls that 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 goes off the radar. We don't even know where they go to. A majority of them is coming out of Kauai um, and Hawaii Island, and we don't know what what is happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and if we could have access to these children and give them a place to stay, then we can be doing the good work, and that's the long term um, there. But overall, bra, the next three to four years, Hawaiian. As an ambassador of Aloha, I want to spread the message of Aloha far and wide um, and have speaking engagements all around the world, have online courses to teach people how to live in the way of Aloha, how to reconnect to their kupuna, and, and then reintroduce the kind of music of the ambassadors of Aloha of Hawaii, mm. the Alfred Apakas, you know, um, of Hawaii, and ho- hopefully in these next five to six years to potentially have a Waikiki show to teach people about that. I love that. Amazing, amazing. Uh, yeah. I know you're going to be able to, to accomplish it all and Mahalo I'll be right there. Kaka'o in yes, and everything. So Absolutely. Love it. All right, before we end the podcast, I got to know, what is your life hack? Okay, my life hack. Who? Um, I call this, they can call it the warrior morning. I call it the morning man. And what I do every single day in the morning is I get up and the first thing that I do is I head into the bathroom. We live in a cottage. Oh, actually, the first thing that I do is I go to have a greens of greatness and I have pure mana. That's the first thing that I do in the morning. I pray, have intention. I connect to my breath. Um, I head into the bathroom. I, I sit. 
and I read a chapter of any kind of Hawaiian cultural or spiritual book. That is what I do first to get that into my mind. Um, then I, I actually go into the shower, and before I turn on the ice water, I sit and I pray and I do my affirmations, and I call forth everything that I'm calling forth in my life with my breath. And then I do a little bit of breathing. I stay in the ice water for about three to five minutes. I take an ice cold shower. I come out, and this is like six o'clock in the morning, even before. Um, I come out, I change, I feel good, and then I do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and uh, 100 squats. 100 Mm -hmm. push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 squats, breathe, and then I program myself into the day. Mm. So that's a life fact that I always do. And then I do not eat any big meals until around 2 to 3 p.m. Okay, you intermittent fasting? I pretty much do intermittent fasting every single day. Thanks. That's what I um, do. It's how I operate best yeah. because just especially if you don't know food and and what you're putting into your body the first thing in your morning you could slow down your entire brain operation and functioning if you put the wrong thing in your body so i do not eat i only eat fruits um an apple banana i have a greens of greenness a protein shake a little bit of grapes and then and then in three o'clock i have a smoothie and a salad and then i may have a poke bowl Mm-hmm. And then I pause that and I come back in the evening and I hit a half an hour workout uh, every other day. I, I only train for 30 minutes every mm-hmm. other day. Oh, wow. And that keeps you in Only 30 minutes, shape. Hawaiian. Only 30 minutes. Wow. Intense. Yeah, yeah, like hit workouts. Intense, but always knowing like how to work out and how to optimize your workouts. Because if you're going to work out for 30 minutes, you better make sure you're optimizing it with all of the nutrients needed. Mm-hmm. So the pre, intra, post workout is, is key. The hour before, the half an hour during, the hour after. I optimize that with bringing nutrients, all the right things to take so that all of the blood is going to the right areas. Mm. I only do full body so that if I'm doing full body and I'm training four days a week, I'm hitting every body part four days a week. I got to talk to you after this about <laughs> some of that. Yeah, you yeah. brother. Okay. All right. That's, that's amazing. All right. So here are my... Last fast fave five questions. Yes. Okay, just rapid fire fast. answers. Yeah, let's go. Favorite hobby? Being with my ohana. Mm. Awesome. Favorite childhood snack? Favorite childhood snack? Cinnabon. Oh, <laughs> I got to get to the middle. I got to go yeah. in Cinnabon after yeah, these. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, this is kind of, I guess, would be similar to that favorite dessert spot. Uh... Favorite dessert spot? Uh, I'm going to say right now, Tropical Tribe for some oh, acai bowls. Got to go check that out. Uh, okay, favorite TV show if you do watch TV? Okay, the favorite TV show um, when I was growing up? I'm going to do when okay. I was growing yeah. up. Uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, the Fresh Prince of Ballet. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> I, I almost thought you would have said like Dragon Ball Z. I feel like nah, you Nah, Fresh Prince of Ballet, yeah, by yeah, Love yeah. Will. <laughs> That's a good one. They got the new show too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, favorite local snack? Uh, so, so like the, you know, like limui mango. Yeah, or yeah, whatever. snack. Uh, so favorite local snack? Um, dried scallops, dried aku chips, whatever. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> uh I never, you know, but I kind of been health conscious a lot of my life, so mm-hmm. I never really ate too never much. Never been a snacker. Um, but but I I would say if maybe on a good early morning when I staying in Waikiki with a good, uh, you know, hot latte would be a malasada. Ooh, from where? Ah, uh, I go stick to Leonard's because yeah. hey, he but the Portuguese <laughs> and bought a cinnamon malasada w- w- with the halpia filling. Is animal, Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. animal. Love it. All right. Well, mahalo so much for coming and talking stories with us today. Uh, definitely got to be a part two because this was such a good episode, at least for me. I hope everybody enjoyed listening to it too. Do you want to share anything else before we wrap up? One last word mm-hmm. is that whoever you need to love and to extend love to, you make sure you love them before it's too late. Love them. Um, and if you have a hard time reaching out to them, just write them a letter. Give your love. Give your compassion. Explain to people how much you do love them because maybe they don't even know how much you love them. Yeah, They haven't ever heard how much you love them. So if you have a chance, uh, 
to extend love to the ones you love, to your kupuna, to your parents, or to the people that need it most. Um, extend your love to them. And every single day, aloha aina, love your land. Aloha akua, love spirit, love aumakua, love your kupuna, and aloha kanaka, love every single human that you come across with because you never know what anybody is going through and how your aloha can uplift them, empower them, and inspire them to be the best they can be that day. Mahalo. Mahalo, beautiful. Um, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at S O N of Oahu. We are launching our uh, healing organization's Instagram soon, which is at Awakened Aloha, where we're going to be putting a lot of our exclusive content that is not going to be on my personal page because I'm like a reporter on that page, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be doing spiritual content and YouTube as well. Um, on our website is awakenaloha.org you get to see so much stuff that we are putting out I'm organizing our store right now with our clothing line that's going to have a launch every single week we also have inspirational wall art that is good metal prints mm -hmm. and we also have the mana medicinals which has our pure mana our noni um, our ava as well as um, our greens of greatness and the, and the other products that we're coming out with and if you guys have any questions you can always email me awakenaloha gmail um, or just reach out to me on Instagram and TikTok I try to get to as much as I I can we got so much people reaching out every day but i love you guys mahalo ahui ho malamapun right on mahalo elijah for joining us on the hawaii verse podcast check us out on hawaiiverse.com the best place to support local and download our free app to start supporting the local businesses it's better aloha be kind to one another and mahalo for listening to us today new episodes every thursday so make sure you follow us and leave a review i'm your host kamaka and you'll hear me next time on the hawaii verse podcast ahui ho <laughs> Um, Thank you, Bada. That was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome, but I mean, you can put two Portuguese in the same room. All good, all good.